Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the school committee meeting tonight. We are returning from executive session, so I'd like to call this meeting back to order, and I'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded, so please silence your devices. Do we have any public comment tonight? Okay, seeing none. Um, welcome our students for the student report. So we have some pretty <laughs> exciting news in the sports community this week. Yeah, so both uh, soccer teams, as you probably know, did exceptionally well this season. Um, girls made it to the semifinals against Lexington, uh, I believe, yesterday. They lost 0-1, to one, unfortunately, but it was a great run. And the boys are still in. Uh, they're playing in Lynn at noon, yeah, Saturday. So... Um, yeah, so both of those teams have had a great season. Um, and then also coming up is this weekend we're having Shorts Fest, which is the annual festival of one-act plays. Um, it's going to be going on on Saturday. There's going to be like two shows, one at 2 and one at 7, and it's basically like a bunch of student-directed plays, and it's going to be really cool. They're going to sell tickets at the door, but also if any students want to buy tickets tomorrow at lunch, they can do that as well. <coughs> Uh, also, football has another game tomorrow at 7 at the high school. Uh, they're still undefeated. It's, I think that there's going to be a big crowd there, seeing as it's the last playoff game, I think. Um, yeah, it's going to be a great time, so lots of people excited. Um, and then today our school photos came out, which is pretty exciting, so people will be bringing them back to the households, hopefully. <laughs> um, and then I also, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and then I know that next week is the open house, and so it's going to be really cool because I know some of the student ambassadors and some of the student council members are going to be giving tours for any students who want them, and yeah. that's going to be on Thursday. Next yeah, week. Thursday the 15th. Yeah. yeah, we always like to give the tours. That's one of my favorite parts of student ambassadors, student council, so looking forward to that. Uh, for, for seventh, seventh and eighth yeah. graders <laughs> who are thinking about coming to the high school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. I think that's it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to approve the minutes. Make a motion to approve the minutes from the meeting on. October 25th, 2018, as presented in the packet. Second. Motion made by Ms. Mabley, seconded by Mr. Trezzi. Any discussion? All right, Mr. Trezzi. Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Motion aye. carries 4 no, four zero. 0 uh, Superintendent's report. Okay, so uh, November 7th, we had research for better teaching in, um, doing tremendous professional development with our new teachers. It's pretty exciting. This is the third year is it the third or the third year so that means um, if we have a teaching staff in North Hanover roughly about 350 teachers will have had 75 trained in research for better teaching foundations and teaching it's the best program I think in America and we bring Sue McGregor up from Maryland she's pretty awesome um, secondly the band um, won the gold medal this week at that Lawrence Invitational over at Veterans Stadium wow. with a 91.3, 91. Point three. Point three. Uh, so they won the gold medal, and that's the little band thing that I learned about at the last competition. I've never heard that done before. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, Medahash Kadori. Uh, he's a fifth grader at the Sajan School. He won the superintendent's uh, summer challenge for reading books. Uh, and his prize was to get any book he wants, and we got it for him. And he chose Atlas Obscura, which is a book about wondrous places uh, with unique facts and strange um, locations. So uh, he was pretty excited about that. Um, and last but not least, two other things. Um, 
the Thanksgiving, uh, the town of North Andover is going to be providing anyone who's still displaced by gas. If you read the last superintendent's newsletter, uh, in the first paragraph, we reached out again to anyone that needed help with transportation and or lunch uh, to contact their principals if they haven't done so. But the town will also be providing prepared turkey dinners and the full works or fixings, I think. Fixings, as they say in the South, maybe. Um, uh, for folks, more details to follow. So as soon as I hear more from the town, I'll tweet that out. Um, and last but not least, the next school committee meeting is November 29th at the Senior Center at 9.30 in the morning so that we can get some folks maybe work second shift. Definitely get the seniors there, and we'll have uh, the social-emotional learning presentation, and we'll have uh, Heidi Waters and Maureen Ryan in to talk about understanding our differences. So, superintendent's report. Thank you. Chair's report. Um, Live Your Learning Education Foundation dinner is next Saturday night. Tickets are still available. That's at the Brooks School, and it's catered by our previous superintendent's wife. Um, that's to help students who cannot afford to go or need financial assistance for field trips. Um, and you can find tickets on the North Andover Foundation for Education website, and there's probably a link from our website as well, North Andover Public Schools. Um, and then I'd like to congratulate Christina Minacucci. She is a North Andover... Um, vice chair of the school building committee and she has kids in our elementary middle and high school and she just was successful in her bid for state representative so I want to congratulate Christina and now I want to toss it to Helen who has some things to share yep so yesterday I attended the health advisory committee uh, meeting and they meet four times a year and um, terrific group it's all our school nurses our school physician um, other resources the um, youth Center um, and joining us for the first time was Deanna Cruz who is our community support coordinator um, on the town um, side of things but she's going to be um, closely working with us and I brought some of her cards if anybody um, in the public wants them and I shared that with you guys um, of course there was discussion about the gas crisis and the ongoing support that they're giving there we have two presentations that are going to come up this winter um, one is going to be Dr. Ruth um, oh, Poti. 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 Um, both with staff in the daytime and uh, the community parents in the evening. Um, I don't have a time for that yet, but they'll put it on the school calendar. And in February, we're going to have a health and wellness expo that will take place in the field house at the high school. Um, eighth graders will come up. It will be open to the public as well as to um, our high school students. And we had a very successful event a few years ago on this, so um, that's going to be on February 5th. Again, the information will be on the website. Um, and then finally, we had a great... Um, report from Erica Murphy about what's going on at the kindergarten for food. They're being very successful over there, and one of the things I think we can celebrate is um, they've already got food rescue up and running over there, um, so we're able to help out in those ways. That's all. Thank you, Helen. All right, Mr. Jackson. <coughs> all right, Mr. Jackson, before you get started, so we have all of our principals here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. And Erin O'Loughlin's filling in from Miss Leahy for the Sergeant School. Um, we asked um, Chet to go first. I know, um, you know, the high school's a little bit different of a test. So we thought we'd ask Chet to go first, and then we could go over the couple field trips at the high school, and then go back and do the three through eight. Mr. Jackson, before we start, though, um, I forgot to ask Caitlin, are there any updates on uh, the passes to the bathroom? <laughs> it, was a, it was a big topic of a conversation last week with the student reps. Uh, no updates. Um, we, we, we always encourage our uh, faculty to uh, give passes and definitely wow. try and do our best to hold students accountable. Nothing new. Um, just kind of a reminder from me uh, to our staff to make sure that we're accountable to where students are uh, through there <laughs> and um, doing our best to, to make sure that happens. So throughout the times, any time in the year with certain things that go on, um, you know, I'll send out reminders in my weekly uh, newsletter to staff. So. Uh, Nothing really new there. Okay. It must be going okay, or Caitlin would have told us more. I forgot to ask her. I just. Yeah. Uh, I think so. I think they're good. Yeah. I think they're good. All 
All right, so um, North Andover High School, we have Chet here tonight. Thank you so much for coming, Chet. Um, and the high school still taking the leg legacy exam. So. Yes. And if someone, does someone have the, there we go. That's what I was looking for. Uh, I want, uh, 46, I think, is where um, I start. Yeah, that's right. Down at the bottom. With the accountability percentile. No, keep going, keep going. It's one of these. Yeah. The bar down the there you go. There we go, right there. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, so I think we have a series of about uh, six or seven slides for the high school. And at the end, I'll t we're going to talk about more specifically uh, kind of what we're doing, what our areas uh, we want to celebrate, and kind of our areas of opportunity toward the end, just so that I know that Laureen and her staff last school committee meeting went through a lot of what the data means. Um, they've done a great job with our staff, um, our department coordinators, myself, kind of giving some explanations and really raising our capacity into what some of these new metrics are that we're being measured by. So just a little thank you to them uh, publicly as well. Uh, so first, our accountability percentile is using all available indicators for the high school uh, against all other high schools that are 9 through 12. Uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but 66% percentile means that we're doing basically two-thirds if you put all the schools in our um, age bracket or grade bracket together, 66% of them we're doing better than and 33% of them. We're not. 65. 65% of we're 66. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, thank you. Um, all right, uh, progress to, toward meeting targets. Uh, this next slide is our comparison against the district. Uh, the district percentile is 43. Um, that's all the schools in the district, and we are at 40%. Uh, the next slides are going to show um, basically how our 40% is kind of made up of. Okay, um, progress toward measuring targets uh, the weight, with the weighting percentages on the right, uh, that 47.5%, going down, kind of shows the weight categories that those five headers have at the high school. Uh, English made our largest jump toward meeting those targets, uh, as you can see by gathering seven of, um, my notes here, of the eight points on the top two sections. Um, we received 10 points in the high school completion category as well. Um, you know, at this district and school levels, we're looking into our coding of attendance uh, for chronic absenteeism and how we label our advanced coursework at the high school. I think a lot of the learning curve in listening to Laureen, uh, Kristen, and Kara, uh, and really going back even with Mike Grant and Steve Nugent on how we list and code specific categories could lead to a possible bump up in that number as well. Um, you know, these are the first time we've seen a lot of these metrics, so we're in, in going through this process trying to figure out, you know, how they're measured as well. So we're doing some work at the district level and the school level there. All right. Uh, next slide is progress toward meeting targets, uh, North Andover Public Schools versus the high school. Um, you can see in this, in this slide that our scores versus the district in all targets versus the lowest 25%. Uh, we're above the district at 50 versus 40 in progress toward improvement in all, uh, but significantly lower at 24 versus the 55, um, with our lowest 25%. And that's, uh, you know, an, and we get to that a little bit later, we're going to eventually get that list of students in the lowest 25% at the high school that in our, our work at during professional days this past Tuesday and before, our coordinators are itching to get those, those names to work with, so. Next slide. All right, this slide 50 shows the breakdown of the high school's lowest 25%. Uh, ELA gave us uh, three of our possible five points. They had a good year in their growth uh, and achievement measures uh, this past MCAS score. And that last slide basically shows that circled score of 40% in the middle at the bottom uh, is the 55% combined with the 24%. Uh, for that progress toward in all students combined with the progress to or the progress of the lowest 25 percent both of those are 50 percent of those those numbers combined and make the 40 percent total 
uh, which at the first screen was compared against the district 43%. So a lot of numbers, a lot of data uh, for us to kind of go through as a school and as all principals here with us tonight. So what, what to do with all of it? Uh, Jim, if you want to go to that next one for me. Thanks. Um, just a couple of things in going through our data. Uh, North Denver High School is a high achieving school. We have been for a number of years. When we look at how our departments score in advanced versus proficient, uh, just in, on that CPI metric of the test, that old metric of the test, um, you know, in science, 88% of our students are in either advanced or proficient, um, well above the state average, which is 75%. On English, uh, where a lot of um, a lot of students score very high. Uh, we have 94% this year advanced and proficient against the state average of 91. Uh, again, we had a, a good year of growth uh, in the English department, ELA, 61% uh, in that range of moderate to high growth, um, which is a good number. And in math, 88% advanced and proficient versus the state average of 78%. So on the achievement level, our kids score high uh, on, on the exam. I think. You know, it makes it, and going back to those other slides a little bit, and that progress toward it, the higher you score, they put your next progress there a little bit higher. So um, we have to keep up that momentum to, you know, get those points on those scores. Right. For areas of opportunity, um, improvement on progress toward improvement targets and growth uh, that showed in those previous slides. A uh, few things we're doing, uh, you know, our team of uh, teaching and learning, uh, that I was lucky enough to have at my PAC meeting last night as well. So Lorene, Kristen, and Kara are doing double duty the last two nights as they were speaking on Beyond the Classroom last night. But they've been meeting with our department coordinators. Uh, they've come down a couple of times to meet with uh, all three, uh, Debbie Daly, Amy O'Terry, and Carrie Caffrey Zwingy for English Language Arts, Science, and Math. And we have some scheduled in the future as well uh, to kind of help them, prepare them to meet back with their departments and guide them through what all this data means. Um, you know, helped us in identifying strengths and needs based on that data. Uh, the math, science, and English um, have begun uh, on last Tuesday reviewing item analysis and recommending adjustments, whether it's to curriculum, whether it's to specific teaching practices uh, within those three specific department cohorts. Um, and again, we're itching to get those names in the bottom 25 uh, when they come out, hopefully in a few weeks, uh, so that we can get those names of kids to teachers uh, at the classroom level to really look at what they, you know, what their strengths and areas are at different, uh, you know, content areas and be in a plan for individuals. I think that'll help us in really preparing out whether it's a ninth grader for a year and a half or a tenth grader that's going to be taking MCAS. So um, at the general level, those are things we're doing. Um, I also brought some info back on Tuesday we had some work in, in math, ELA, and science. I know the elementary and middle conferences, we were lucky enough and fortunate enough to have full day PD time. So in the math department, uh, after meeting with uh, Lorene and Kara, uh, they looked at the new format of the test, watched a webinar that kind of broke down um, the difference between the computer-based model that we're going to um, in the future and the one we've been using in the past. Uh, so they watched that webinar um, they were able, you know, to kind of learn how students are going to use that technology on the computer and kind of go back at the classroom level and teach skills on that computer-based testing that we don't have the familiarity at the high school, but they've done, I know, at lower levels. Um, they used a protocol called I Noticed, I Wondered in looking through the data um, to kind of develop next steps within the whole department. Uh, they're going to be looking at specific students from different cohorts to analyze their results looking at individual student data to see, uh, you know, if there's some areas where students are leaving specific questions blank, uh, review sample MCAS questions and incorporate them into their classroom assessments uh, stylistically to help prepare students. Tenth grade teachers will be scheduling Chrome cart time for tutorials and practice. Um, also looking to identify some areas to collaborate with the special education uh, teachers to work on that transition to the test. They'll explore some online math software to incorporate into classroom discussions, uh, and continue to look at our inclusion model in small groups to make sure we're grouping our kids and setting them up to succeed. Um, for ELA, uh, they also watched the webinar uh, and found it very useful as a department. Had a discussion to identify the changes that have been made between, uh, again, the computer-based test and the traditional tests uh, that have been used in the past. 
Uh, they want to determine implications of the next generation MCAS exam and what it has on our actual teaching practice. Uh, Ms. Ando presented to the department, wherever she is in the back, um, in the afternoon about specific data and results from last year's exam and helped answer some questions. A lot of the stuff and that we went through in the earlier slides, our teachers just don't know and how, are aware of how that data is calculated, so it's very helpful uh, to kind of get their input into um, what they can do to support kids based on that data. So she was very helpful in raising the capacity for our teachers. And also um, today, um, with we had some screening going on uh, with our sophomores, our teachers were able to get together and talk about some curricular changes. They're going to make an adjustment to the research paper sophomore year um, to be able to spend some more time on various types of writing and pull some additional resources to uh, focus on synthesis within the English department. So they were able to do that just today. Uh, so once we kind of got this data, we're trying to use our time strategically and our collaborations to kind of prepare for these adjustments. Uh, science department, they reviews their, re reviewed their MCAS item analysis, um, also using the I Notice, I Wonder protocol. Uh, <coughs> did it as a whole group to get some input. The biology teachers that, teach, that take, teach the majority of students that take the ninth grade exam then met separately, uh, used that item analysis and data to identify next step. Uh, they're going to identify those lowest 25 percent. They're rewriting some curriculum uh, to be aligned to their new standards that have been worked on, specifically in science. Um, and they're navigating the transition from the current MCAS test to the new one that's going to be happening in science, and I believe it's in 2020. So a lot of, lot of work that's already happened in the last uh, couple days that we're going to continue to build next steps as early as next Wednesday to kind of prepare kids in March. Um, March, May, and June for their specific exams. Some questions? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. I have questions. Yeah, go ahead. Colin. So one of my one of my first questions is um, this list of you know, like 88 percent were advanced or proficient in science, 94 percent advanced mm -hmm. or proficient. Is that of first time test takers? Yeah. So that's for the um, for this past test. Yeah. So for the 10th grade exam in 2018. Okay, so then... All the 88% of those students scored advanced and proficient. Okay, yeah. and so it excludes anybody who had to take the test a second time or a third time. Correct, yeah, it's just that spring, that specific spring exam. But, so, so help me understand that. Yeah. So if, if I'm a sophomore and I don't pass the science exam, I have to take it again as a junior. Correct. Do I take it at a different time of year? Do Correct. I, okay, yep. all right, yep. thank you, that's yeah, very helpful different to retest take time. So our overall, it would be helpful for me to know what our overall pass rate is on, on MCAS because that tells us whether or not kids can graduate, right? Correct. Yeah, I think our overall, in adding that up, we, we have that pretty public uh, somewhere. It, I, I think we don't for the first time for in, this one. that I can recall yeah. in North End of History, 100% of every student that took the ELA test passed. Yeah. That's great. Um, and yeah. it's typically not the case. Um, yeah, we typically don't have, we have maybe a few that may fail a specific subject area, math, or very rarely ELA, it's one or two, or even bio, but after the retake times, we very rarely have someone enter senior year that hasn't passed. That's great. It's not passing the test. That's you know different metrics we're looking at for growing. Yeah, students. I just think it's really important to say that out it loud is. so I that agree. we're not looking at that going well. Twelve percent of our kids aren't going to graduate yeah. um, if yeah. it's the same twelve percent that that don't make it the first time through. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you for saying that. Um, you had great growth in English, and I wonder you know what changes you made or what you feel like you did that was successful. Yeah, I I don't know. I think. It's a great question. Uh, year to year, I think we've been continuously looking at different places and where different topics are done in the curriculum year by year within our student learning goals, uh, SMART goals for the department. And I think Ms. Caffrey Zwingy with her department, they continue to focus on writing uh, and then different, different topics in the curriculum. So I just think it's, uh, we do collaboration very well and are really working to get better. And I think a lot of the stuff we work with our standards align the curriculum helps kids in the longer term. So I don't know if it's unspecific. I can absolutely go back to see if there's maybe, uh, you know, maybe something that was specific that may have sparked that. But, you know, I just think year by year we're looking to match our curriculum and grow students and make a more rigorous education and assess the right way. So, um, And then 
I know the high school is using what, what we're still calling the legacy test, right? Yes. So did you all look at not using these metrics, but using some of the metrics that we've used in the past to see you know, how your students have grown and how, how they're compared to prior years? Like, are you feeling, because I mean, every year we used to look compared to prior years, and we're yeah. not doing that this year, which I understand, but I'm just curious if you looked at that and if you saw any trends that were encouraging or concerning or... Yeah, I think some of them matched in the in, in the in the data that we showed. I think for English, they went up to uh, I think it was over fifty, I may have dropped down like a fifty one percent growth in the old SGP, which was up. I know they were forty two years ago and maybe close to the forty eight. Don't quote me on it. I have to look it up uh, for this year. But you know, math went down. They went up the up last year and went down from last year to this year uh, in the growth. So I think in not knowing and learning what these new metrics are. I did go back and look at the old metrics to see because we're still learning kind of what affects what when you're adding on, um, you know, maybe some different uh, point indicators. We're talking about absenteeism. and Yeah, I just think that so. before we lose yeah. the comparative data, which we will when yeah. they do the computerized testing this mm -hmm. year, right? Yeah, we're doing it for the first so time. So this will be for the first time, and we're going to kind of lose that continuity after this. So I'd mm -hmm. love to capture that yeah. up till now. Yeah, we have it, and I think I've, I've looked at it, and I think it, again, I think for ELA, math, and bio, they went back and looked at those item analysis and, and have that, that data as well. So, you know, they're also looking at where their curriculum may be changing in a test to make sure we're not missing things for kids as well. So we do have an eye on the past, but we're looking forward to. So, and this question came from yeah. some parents to me, so I just want to bring it to you. Sure. Have you done analysis between um, <coughs> what the MCAS data tells you and what our grades show you, like our kids who are you know, advanced or proficient, do their grades look like advanced or proficient? And kids who are <coughs> needs improvement or whatever the new categories are, do, do their grades look like that as well? We haven't done it for this set of data, data okay. yet. I think we're just getting it to try and prepare some things. But some do you generally do that though? Like We've done it in the past, I think a couple years ago um, on it. I think it depends on kind of what we determine our focus areas are, you know, based on this timeline and preparing kids for, for MCAS as well. But I, I think it's And I, I think get this worthy, is a whole... Yeah, it, it's worth, I think, to look back at and just say, are kids being, you know, are they placed appropriately in classes? Does, you know, does where their coursework, um, they're working on match kind of where our higher scores would be. But I think what makes it tricky is that we're measuring growth in a cohort now, which is a big focus. And now we're having to focus on the lowest 25% of our mm -hmm. schools because that counts as a metric. So we... We get caught on a lot of different areas and want to make sure we can have a focus too. So, yeah. But I think it's something we've done in the past, and you know, we, thank we're, you. I think, we're absolutely able to do it. Yeah, I think I'm good. Thanks. No, you're welcome, Ellen. Thank you. So, sophomores last year, a group of them had to take something online that didn't count on top of this. Yes. Was that the 2.0, or was that? Something completely so different. So that was the computerized. Uh, I think every school had to do math or ELA. Right. We ended up with math, math to pilot, right. um, and it was a lot just the future of what we're going to test this year with the computer model. So it was like a dry run type of thing. Yeah. So we had a bunch of Chrome, Chrome cards in the cafeteria. Right. You know, Mike Grant came by to make sure our Wi-Fi and we had the infrastructure uh, in that area to to accurately give the test. Right. And I think through the district lens, you know, I know we've ordered a bunch more Chrome cards so we can actually give. 300 plus tests on the same day um, as we go through for the ELA and then for math. Right. That's gonna be something we've never done at that sort of scale. Right. But I know they've done it at the middle school uh, right. successfully in the past, and Mike's ensured us that Can it's do no it. problem. So that was kind of done <laughs> yeah. to see like a process, but yeah. did you also get to look at that data? We did not get the data back. So one they're thing not willing to give that because that would have been incredibly valuable to see versus the, no. to compare. Like my my kid yeah. unfortunately had to do that also. Yep. So to, to compare the two things would be interesting to see to get ready for this year. Like yeah. oh gosh, this is what kind of gap we saw between. Yeah. Or it might be that some kids do much better using a computer. Yeah. Our so. teachers were looking for it too, but one of the they designs and the rules were it's almost like you're helping the test takers, you know, with their questions. prep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But no, we, we don't Just get that curious. back. But, but it's no, good that you did a dry run, so yeah. that's helpful. No, it was very helpful, I think, for that. And our guidance department does such a great job in giving the test. And it's it's going to be a little bit more efficient for them. Um, you know, uh, by just knowing everything's logged in immediately, so it's color coded on your screen, you know, you know which exam is actually left out or not done. So there's a lot less bubbling. A lot less <laughs> bubbling. A lot less paper and pencil. Yeah, a lot of pros test, to there. Test a lot of pros security. To there. I mean, it's a, it's a radical change. 
when the high school test sunsets, that's where the CBT, the computer-based testing, is really getting them ready, and then they'll shift the test itself. Yeah. Well, and they should be used to it because they'll have done it at the middle school for a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, the students are used to it, yeah. 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 But it's also teachers aren't used to our it. Our teachers aren't used to it yet, yeah. <coughs> but they will be. We'll get there. Of course. Thanks. You're welcome. So I have one question. Yeah. The bottom 25% that you're going to identify, yeah. and maybe you can't answer this yet, <laughs> what specific strategies will you put in place once you identify? I know letting the teachers know, but then yeah. what? Do they get extra? <laughs> no, I think that's a good help. question. I think part of it is where are they? So where are they located in classes? Are they, you'll know, are they clustered in a, a particular class or one or two? Um, so I think part of that and listening, especially in the math department um, and going through and I talked about a couple of different things they're looking to do, whether it's some online support. I think if they're clustered in one or two or three classes, that but I think you, you can look for specific <laughs> interventions there. So mm -hmm. I think they've talked about it on Tuesday a little bit of some of the items they could do. But once we have names and locations for them and it becomes real, I think it'll then, and then you can kind of look through where their specific you know what topics is it geometry is it number sense for math and something like that because then you can identify you know maybe weaknesses in those topics and then do specific intervention so i think you have to start with the kids and then be able to break have some some online tools and some people and support from central office that are very good at that uh to kind of you know break that data down and make it useful for teachers so and how I long does it have, they, I, how long does it, it take to get the names The state, the state said we'll have them by November 1st. November 1st? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, no, that's the truth. Yeah. Um, as you can see, um, we've had staff uh, taking webinars. Yeah. Um, you have to remember, remember last year the test, they, they, they had a hard time correcting it, the state. It didn't come out until almost November. Um, and now um, these new categories, I mean, they're so radically different. Mm -hmm. I mean, this makes a lot of sense to me. I know, I, yeah. I know this in, inside and out. Um, but when you go back to the others, you know, those are all new categories. And this is only the first year we have anything to compare it to because it's, it's a baseline based on last year. So I do think it's going to take a little bit of time for the state to norm this. To, I mean, they're doing some work on their end, too, I believe. Can I, can I give an I notice, I wonder? Yeah, sure. Um, so I noticed that our science and math are lower than our ELA. And I wonder... Um, if we change to the physics MCAS instead of the bio MCAS, if both of those would go up? Yeah, I... <laughs> you don't have to answer that. Yeah. You can just think I about I it. Yeah, I don't, but I, I think they're the furthest above the state average, too. So I think it depends on how you measure success. I think sure. for science, too, they're, they're the ones historically that have been better than the state average, probably even higher than math and EL. But they, we, achieve, we achieve very high rate at the high school in all departments. So yes, congratulations as on that. As that. Yeah. Absolutely. I would love to see physics earlier at the high school. That's yeah, no. not well, a secret. Well, that's a whole different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, and it's noted. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I do have one other thing that's actually going to be true for all of these. And, and yeah. I think that Lorene and the team talked about this a little bit last time. But this whole, the, the new measurements of um, absenteeism and um, advanced coursework completion. Can you just remind me what those numbers mean? Does, so one means that we have tons of kids absent, or one means so, that we don't. So if we're looking, I'm just, I'm actually just clicked on slide 51, so I'm looking at our, um, yeah. So chronic, chronic absenteeism, the, the highest number of points if you were, did not have a lot of students absent. You would be four. Yeah. Would be four. So that looks so like that we have a ton of students high. absent. Right. So that's actually um, something that came up in the meeting that Helen and I were yesterday with the Health Advisory Council. Um, we, we formed what we call today an equity squad. So there was a group of us that went to a DESE conference last week on access and equity, and that is one of the things that we are addressing there. We were at a meeting this afternoon um, looking at a new health grant, and that is one of the things that we're going to include in there. So it's something that we are looking to address as a district because um, the high school is not the only school that... that that's that, what's going to come that, up all night. That's that why I asked it now. It looks yeah. like an issue. So that's something we're addressing. And then Chet touched on the, um, in the, the advanced coursework is only at the high school level. You see that we have zero out of four points. That really cannot be correct. Yeah. So that we <laughs> well, given these numbers, it made no sense. That's why I was wondering. That we believe has something to do with the coding of the classes, and that was something that came to Kristen's attention and my attention when we went to 
um, a workshop one uh, it was a Friday morning Thursday morning and other districts had already started to look into that and talk about that and discovered you know how there were some coding errors with that it can also be some coding errors in terms of attendance as well in power school and how things are being looked at so those are things that we as a team are going to continue to try to um, investigate further okay because the absentee thing is is overall a student's time in school it's not during the test taking period no it is not mm -hmm. so again just because that looks it's terrible but <laughs> it's 10 percent would be considered chronically absent so if you were a student who was here for the entire school year 180 days you're looking at 18 days or more would be considered chronic absenteeism if you were a student who came halfway through the year so you were here for 90 days it would be nine percent uh, or nine you know nine, nine days right 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 so, <laughs> okay yes and, and, and talking to other superintendents too the, the data that the state collects from all schools it's called, it's called SIFT, so they SIFT it once a week. They take it and pull it from the database, uh, and we believe, at least I believe, that the, I believe that Desi has some work to do on their end, well, too. This is the first time they've pulled this all together, right? Yeah. Yes. I think that we have to make sure our coding's correct, but I'd also like to check on their end because, I mean. So it seems like how do you, oh, sorry, I finished it. It seems like how do you get these great results and then have horrible absentee right. problem. And we right. know we have advanced coursework here. Mm -hmm. We know that we have higher level math classes, science classes, we have AP classes. We know they exist, so to have a zero there. Is odd. Yeah. So we, we okay. need to look right. at, we do need to look at Thanks. some of those pieces. It, it might be helpful outside of this for us to have some information about what our absentee rate is mm -hmm. um, so that we could give some confidence to the public that we don't have kids that are, you know, chronically right. out of school. We can run that, it's easy. Yep. Good. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Out of order field trip. Yep. It's not out of order. It's in our order. Oh, right. <laughs> See, that's why Holly did and it. While that you're way. still here, Mr. Jackson, we're going to That's why I stood to the side, yep. just so that yeah. I can come right with my wonderful girls lacrosse program. Yeah. Excellent. We have the second reading of our girls lacrosse overnight trip. So I know that. Uh, oh, do we do the motion first? Or we discuss first. We can do it. Okay, okay. I know that one um, concern that Mr. McDevitt, who was unable to come tonight because he's traveling, shared was, what exactly is the giving back part of it? <laughs> and is there and is and why are we? His other part of it is why are we going to Maryland? Is there are there any opportunities locally to do that? I mean, I think the the giving back part is you know here in North Andover we're so fortunate to have all these opportunities to come play sports at North Hanover. And even growing up in the youth programs, we're so lucky, lucky to have such strong programs. And you know, we're growing up given a coach, we're given all the, this equipment, like we've had everything growing up. And so to be able to go somewhere that doesn't have that and help out is something that's really special, not only for our team, but definitely for the girls that would be in Baltimore that we're helping. Um, we also, we've been doing youth uh, clinics throughout the years, helping kids in North Andover. Um, and you know, we volunteer at those all the time. We coach teams. And so that's what make this, this makes it different, um, that we're going somewhere else and we can give back to some, a different community rather than just North Andover because we do that a lot all during the year. Yeah, and um, it's also like a good thing for like the whole entire like North Andover like lacrosse program, like a kind of like a, bonding opportunity for all of us and Maryland is a really big state for lacrosse so being able to go somewhere where it's really popular but girls some girls aren't able to really be privileged enough to like have the opportunity to play and we're able to go there and really show them how and really get to know other girls from somewhere else is like something really big for us would think would be a good opportunity and the Hall of Fame is there too right yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a cool little aside that I think would be cool for them to see. You know, you come to the Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, soccer's huge everywhere, so everyone gets to experience it. And lacrosse, I don't think, is as big in, it's growing in New England, but in Maryland, it's a whole different thing. It's like, you know, if you were a kid in um, Lawrence or Boston and you never had, had the opportunity to play soccer, and for down there, that's, that's the same thing for them. It's, that's all they see is lacrosse, and these girls don't have the opportunity, and this foundation um, empowers these girls to, through leadership, through the sport of lacrosse, to better themselves, better their community, and really just give them the chance to do this sport that they see all over the place, especially in their state. 
So it's a, I think it's a very, very cool opportunity. There are programs in the area, and we've collected donations and stuff for them in the past, as we've done with um, the, youth, the North Hanover Youth Program. A couple years ago, we collected um, sticks and other equipment for the boys' programs and the girls' programs, so they have a surplus of that, and we thought we could bring the same thing down there because they don't have as much of that opportunity. <coughs> do um do the students that you're going to work with have any ongoing or is it kind of like a one and done for them it's ongoing they 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 set it up as kind of their own little like clinics essentially that they consistently go to but it's coached by you know the same two or three women that run the foundation um they get they set up themselves up in different schools and this would be them all coming together um, we're trying, if, if it's approved, to hopefully go and play at the field at U.S. Lacrosse, which is, was built, I believe, two years ago. And so that would be also a cool opportunity for those girls to all come together and see girls from different schools. And then these guys who, as they've said, have the experience of coaching our own youth players would be able to go and coach these girls as well. Thanks. You're and just quickly, just... Coach Pryor, Meredith Pryor, girls lacrosse, you want to introduce your captains? These are captains here with you today? Yeah, these are my captains. Hi guys. Um, Kelly. I'm Kate. Madam Chair, I make a motion to approve the um, North Road High School Girls of Class um, trip from March 29th, 2019 to March 31st, 2019 to Baltimore, Maryland. Second. Motion by Mr. Truzzi, second by Ms. Mabley. Aye. 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 And aye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for Thank coming, you coming in and explaining. Yes. I mean, it's our job to make sure that these are, you know, safe and appropriate and all those other things. But it's also just really nice for us to hear, you know, what it really means rather than just sort of seeing the general information. So thanks well, for coming in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll resume with the rest of our MCAS presentations for grades for the elementary school and middle school. And we will start with Atkinson. Or do you want to do introduction first? Ladies and gentlemen, um, they always talk about that, Gordon. Yeah. Um, Listen to the slides. From left to right, we've got Mr. Cushing here from the Kittred School, Mr. Raymond from the private Albert E. Thompson, and there's a veteran celebration there tomorrow. Um, Mr. Gonsalves uh, from the North Enderman Middle School, Erin O'Loughlin representing Karen Leahy from the Sergeant, Joe Clark from the Franklin, Greg Landry from the Frederick Atkinson Schools. Thank you. I've never heard that said, Frederick Atkinson. I would not have known that, so thank you. Former doctor in town. Yeah. I knew that part, but I never heard his first name. So. All right. We're we ready? Um, technically, we're ready. All right. Well, thank you for having us here tonight, too. Um, we're going to hear We're going to hear from... Um, elementary and middle school principals. We're here to talk about numbers. You already got the example from Chet. Uh, I want to thank the central office staff for putting together the six slides for us that will introduce the numbers for our school and then we'll be able to add a little bit more information about how we're going to address some of those numbers. We'll try to be clear and efficient. There's a lot of us to go and um, if it'd be okay with you, we'd like to answer questions for all five elementary schools when we're all done our presentations, if that'll work. That was going to be my question. Function wise. So at the end. Is that okay? You already broke the rule. You already asked a question. <laughs> I was asking to clarify. I started, yeah. She answered a question with a question, actually. Uh, so as we begin, we thought it was important to include a slide. A little bit of this has been discussed already, but um, the DESE gave all schools and districts, as the new results came out, some advice. So that's what this slide is about. They really don't want us to compare new data to historical results because of percentile performance against targets additional indicators, fewer years, different comparison groups. So they, they think we shouldn't equate. It's hard not to do it. It's tempting, but um, they don't want us to equate 2018 accountability categories with um, assistance levels in the past or accountability from the past. They say there's no crosswalk between the categories and the levels. However, they do want us to use it for internal planning purposes, and that's what we're planning to do and what we've already done uh, on a lot of levels. So. I think Gilly used the term baseline data earlier, and that's how we're looking at it. This is a starting point for us. So Atkinson's numbers are um, our accountability percentile, a new category, uh, on last spring's testing, uh, we have a 33. 
which is uh, Larry Bird's number and uh, one of my faves. Um, but it means that we outperform 32% of other public elementary schools in the state. The next slide highlights Atkinson's overall progress towards improvement targets. Atkinson met 39% of its targets compared to the district's 43. All students, the aggregate at Atkinson tested in those grades, grades three to five, they met 11% of the DESC targets in 2018. Then we have that new category called the lowest 25%, and Atkinson students in this group met 67% of their DESC targets. Same information on the next slide, really, but it just uh, highlights that the lowest 25 group scored points for achievement growth in that um, tricky chronic absenteeism category. And finally, the sixth slide puts it all together. It shows the 11% that was mentioned earlier, the 67% for the lowest 25 group. They average them together to determine the overall Atkinson percentage towards meeting the DESE targets, and that's the, that 39% in 2018. So moving forward with MCAS, now that we have more information about scoring in the new system, we can try to target our work better. So the teachers, staff, and I will be setting individual MCAS performance goals with all students really formalizing it this year. We've, we've done that in the past, but we're going to try to formalize it a little bit more in grades three to five. And we hope that this really engages the students more on when that testing window comes along and how they perform on the computer-based testing. We're looking to increase collaboration and coaching opportunities as often as possible. We've already started that. We had a great round. Five weeks in a row, the coaches and the curriculum coordinators came to our schools and really broke down the item analyses in ELA and math. It was a great start. We've never done it like this before. So we're hoping in grades one to five, I mean, the first and second grade teachers were a little bit curious at first about um, why are we looking at MCAS, but we looked at trends and saw where some work in those grades might impact some of the results that come later. So that's really a cool thing to think about. Um, just collaboration in general is impactful, and we've seen some, some really great work done at um, the Atkinson and across the schools. And the third piece of um, where we're looking for areas for opportunity is continuing to work with central office to increase the, su the supports for Atkinson students. You know, when we look at Title I grant funding, reading support, special ed, um, class size, those are things you all talk about all the time, too. So um, we're always saying more, more, more. I think we're all saying more, more, more. But, um, you know, those can deliver some results for us down the line, I think. As I conclude, I wanted to call out some of our school's highlights. Um, it's at the top of that last slide. And it relates specifically to fourth grade performance in last year's uh, testing window. Grade four, they outperformed the state on all test items in ELA and math, which was great to see. Uh, the overall grade four SGP in math was over 60, which we all want to see each year. Grade four ELA for our economically disadvantaged students, uh, the growth there was over 60 as well. And our former ELL group, um, they had an incredibly high SGP of 98. Is that, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I've never seen an SGP of 98. Yeah. And also in math, the SGP for the economically disadvantaged group uh, was 74, which is incredible and the high need subgroup in that grade level uh, was in the high 60s for their SGP. So I just wanted to celebrate that. Lots of factors go into why that grade level outperformed some other grade levels, but um, I attributed a lot to the collaboration that that team does. It really maximized their time, and I think it reaps its benefits. So I'd like to pass the microphone over to Mr. Joe Clark now, and he's going to talk about Franklin School numbers. Oh, thank you, Ms. Landry. Principal of the Benjamin Franklin Elementary School, home of the Dragons. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. The VFW. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Franklin Accountability Percentile this year, um, in its first year of looking at this metric, was 74, meaning that we outperformed 73% of other public elementary schools across Massachusetts. Franklin as a whole met 58% of their um, targets this year, compared to the 43% of the district. We're going to break that down now and look first at our all students aggregate. And you can see that my all students group met 70% of their targets. You can see some higher numbers up top. And then again, down, on, down below that chronic absenteeism, that's a number that we're really trying to figure out and dig a little deeper into and to understand that a little bit better. 
uh, but overall we met 70% of our targets. Now when we think about this lowest 25% that we're talking about now, if we take the lowest 25% um, performing students at the Franklin School, they only met 45% of their targets, which is slightly lower than the district average of 50% of the targets. Um, so that's something that we're definitely going to look at. I'll touch on that a little bit later. And then this breaks it down again in that same um, grid pattern. So you can see where this uh, lowest 25% that they're scoring. And one thing, and again, I'll point this out on my, on my last slide, the the discrepancy between the ELA achievement and the math achievement there, it's, it's startling, if you will. Um, and then again with the chronic absenteeism. Um, I swear, there's kids in the building, I hear them all day, I don't know what's, what's going on. But that's, that's just a weird number. It's a weird number, yeah, and we're, we're, but we're going to dig into that and try to figure out what that is. Um, I think Mr. Jackson talked a little bit about the coding and wondering how that is. Um, and I'm going to have to start saying no to the Disney World vacation trips and mid-November you know I mean it's they're gonna start impacting us sorry <laughs> um, and then this slide again it just puts it all together so we can see the average of the 70 percent of all students and then the 45 percent meeting targets of our lowest 25 and that's where it came up with that 50 percent 58 percent excuse me um, of Franklin meeting their targets which is partially meeting their targets so just one thing I want to call out ELA, and you saw that even in the lowest 25%, they were exceeding their targets. Um, and if we're talking about kind of some of the data that we typically talk about but wasn't, um, wasn't highlighted yet, 71% of our students tested, and that's grades three through five, 71% of them were meeting in the meeting or exceeding expectations category, which is almost 20 percentage points above the state average, and it's actually an increase of 2% from where we were last year. So although 2% doesn't seem like a lot, when you're at those numbers of meeting and exceeding, every percentage is, is something to celebrate. Um, and then back on our all students group, Every uh, um, excuse me, all students met targets in ELA, math, and science. So we hit that three-point mark in each of those categories, which is something I wanted to celebrate too. And as always, we use this data. I mean, one of the most important things about this data is, okay, what are we going to do with it, and how are we going to improve teaching and learning in our school? And I think, you know, I put math up there as a relative weakness in, in terms of what we're doing, where I'm saying only 69% were meeting and exceeding expectations. That's still 21% percentage points above where the state is but it's something we want to look at what I what I found interesting is you know the decrease in the exceeding expectations category so we went from 21 to 17 percent and when you're talking about those numbers it's it's a matter of a few students probably but I like to see the number going the other way like we did up in the ELA so in order to address that you know we're continuing to work with the curriculum coordinators and coaches like Mr. Landry was talking about um, I'd like to echo him in that first round of collaboration. And I remember my first grade team was so invested in, you know, they hadn't really thought about, you know, we talk all the time about, you know, MCAS isn't a three through five exam. It is K to five, one to five. And how are we all addressing this? How are we all working? How are we building that foundation even lower? And I think the coaches um, and curriculum coordinators did an excellent job of really bringing it down and showing where patterns might be that they can work on. And I know I'm um, echoing what Greg said, but I thought it was important to call that out again. Um, one other thing about math that I'm really excited about for this year is this is now, last year was our first year with Eureka Math. This is our second year. We didn't have any piloters the year before. And it was new to parents, it was new to students, it was new to teachers. So we were all kind of learning it at the same time. And even just weeks, a month in, teachers were like, it's so much better this year. You know. I remember second grade last year, the first lesson was on number bonds. And none of the then second graders knew what a number bond was, so they had to spend time teaching what a number bond was. This year they came in knowing it, or at least had that exposure. And they said, man, oh yeah, 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 I remember that from first grade, sure. So just that little boost, I'm really excited about what we're gonna see, what I'm gonna be sitting here next year um, talking about math, and hopefully I'm gonna see math up in that top section. And then the chronic absenteeism, I just, I, I felt like I needed to call it out here because it is something that, it, it's concerning but odd. So it's just something that we want to look at and try to figure out more about and how we can um, impact that. Because 
that's four points that I lost in each of those categories, and that, that could make a big difference. And then the lowest 25%, um, only meeting 45% of the targets. Uh, that's a tough pill for me to swallow, too. You know, we've identified that subgroup based on the data that we have, and many of those students are in our students with disabilities subgroup, which has been a subgroup that we've been continuously working on year after year. Um, so it's really, it's really looking at it now and saying, all right, you know, we have these students. How are we going to develop growth plans for these children so that we can push them to where they need to be, so that we can build that foundation, whatever they're missing, whatever gaps they may have, how are we going to close the gaps with these children and help move them into the place where they can start meeting these targets? Because we know they can. We just have to access whatever's inside them to help them get there. Um, so like I said, I, I'm happy with where we are. The numbers don't reflect my happiness, I think. I think we're, um, when I really look at the data and we've looked at the data as a staff and we look at where our students fell in terms of exceeding, meeting, partially meeting or not meeting expectations, we're happy with the progress that we made. Um, and we had our growth percentiles in the 50s, in the low 50s and 51 was always the number we wanted to be above and we're right around there. We had a few of our subgroups dipped below that this year and that was the first time that that had happened. So that's something that we're gonna look at too. Um, but overall, you know, we're still working hard and doing our best for kids. And at the end of the day, Dave, that's all that matters. All right, I'm going to pass the torch over to my esteemed colleague, Mr. Richard Cushing, Thank principal you, of the Kittredge I, Elementary School. Thank you, Mr. Clark. And I just wanted to say, my happiness does reflect. <laughs> I, I live so, in important. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I, I do want to point it, out to the listening public that there are no more levels. Uh, there are no levels. Five. Yes, I know. So, <laughs> however, I have to say it, it has been a good autumn for Mr. Cushing. You know, Kyrie Irving said that he would probably really, you know, sign again with the Celtics. The Red Sox won the championship. Uh, the accountability uh, percentile at Kittredge was at 88%. Uh, my wife. She conceded, and I was able to get a new car. And I don't know if it's because I had a good report card, you know? So anyways, but, but again, you know, we're really happy. It's a lot of hard work, you know, uh, you know, to get, you know, where we have been, you know, successful for a high-profile school for the, for the past few years, you know? And I really have to say a lot of work, again, like my colleagues ha have said that, uh, uh, using the coordinators as well as the as the coaches, I think uh, last year the the reading coaches, you know, uh, uh, you know, they had a residency at my uh, school as we you know looked at you know what was happening with our reading at kindergarten and first grade. I would like to say that uh, this year coming around, you know, talking about you know MCAS with you know the primary grades was great. But I think to the surprise of some of the coordinators and coaches, uh, that's something we always have done with our entire staff. You know, it's very important to see that they are definitely the building stones for or the foundation, you know, for what we do in grades three, four, and five. So, you know, we always are looking at, when we look at the bottom 25% of kids, we're not just looking at those kids at grades three, four, and five. We were looking at K through five, and now we're looking at one through five. So, uh, you know, all of those are factors that really, you know, we feel are very important to us and have been important to us for, for a long time. Uh, if you look at the next slide, uh, you can see uh, progress, you know, towards improvement targets, you know, was at 88% compared to the 43% of the, uh, of the district. Uh, on the next slide, we see that all students at, uh, at Kittredge, uh, this slide shows the growth that was calculated for all students. All students met 78% of uh, the targets, which is still, you know, it's good. But then, I mean, that's going to, you know, when I get to some of the things that we're going to be looking at at the end, this is something that we need to see, you know. Uh, why was it at 78%? And then if you look at the next slide, we see that our lowest 25% was at 97%. So we've already started to analyze the 78% to find out why that isn't really matching, you know, the 
seven percent. Approximately about four, maybe, yeah, about four years ago, I sat down with one of my favorite uh, assistant superintendents, and we were talking about the, that would be Mr. Gilligan, and we were, uh, what's that? Oh, yes, oh, Jim, you were there too, I thought. <laughs> so, so anyways, but we were actually talking about, you know, what would happen if you looked at that, you know, that bottom, you know, like uh, we were talking 30% of kids and, uh, you know, what we kind of refer to as the low-hanging fruit, you know, and what would that do to your scores and how would it bolster your scores and move your scores up. And so uh, that became one of our school goals, you know, approximately four years ago. And we can see how it really has paid off. And again, you know, it's something that we're really looking at, uh, you know, not grades three, four, and five, you know, but one through five. You can see, you know, the, uh, the lowest uh, of the 25% here and, uh, you know, how that is calculated and how it came out. You know, I mean, it's really amazing that, you know, the points that uh, were received for, for like of achievement in English and, and math, you know, were, you know, the, the total number of uh, four points for each. So, you know, it looks like we're really right on target when we're looking at the interventions for those kids, you know, whether they be tier one, tier two, or then maybe kids that, you know, might need some tier three interventions. Uh, right here, the average for all students in this group, uh, uh, the lowest 25, uh, uh, percent uh, compared to you know the rest of the students you know gives us that average of 88 percent so some of the things that we're looking at you know first of all we celebrated of course the 88 percentile you know you know progress towards improvement targets you know was great you know it really is nice to celebrate that you know the work that we've been doing over the uh, really past four years with the 25 percent of our lowest kids you know is it, it shows, it pays off. And it's not that we're just focused on MCAS. This is what we are doing as a culture and a school. And we're always sitting around talking about, you know, those kids that are falling below benchmark, you know, and what are we going to do for interventions for those kids, you know? And it's everyone at the school who's looking at that. Uh, when we... Uh, uh, and chronic absenteeism, uh, I'm going to tell you, you know, we met all targets there. And it's not easy because, you know, it really takes, uh, you know, we really have a process where we look at, you know, which kids might be, need, be contacted by the guidance counselor, you know, uh, Mrs. Doolin. Uh, we, uh, we have some kids who really exhibit high anxiety, you know, when they are coming to school. We have kids that have school phobias. I mean, these are real, you know, uh, I mean, they really display the symptoms that, you know, are necessary for us to, to work with outside agencies, doctors, and things like that to get these kids to school. You know, uh, Mrs. Hadgen is absolutely fantastic with uh, checking up on kids, you know, who might be, you know, absent a certain amount of time. You know, uh, uh, I mean, if we have a child that is out for two to three days, there's a contact that's made, you know, to the house to find out, you know, what is happening, is child sick, you know, what, and so, so I think we're constantly on that, uh, you know, and uh, so, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, if the kids aren't at school, they're not going to learn, you know, so it's important, and it's important to look at those numbers at all times. Um, Again, when we look at some of the some of the deltas or some of the things that we really need to look at, you know, at our school, there was no change in science, even though we hit, you know, uh, our benchmark of uh, uh, eighty five point five percent, which was uh, uh, the same achievement level that we hit the year before. Uh, however, I think a lot had to do with really a lot of the new programs that were adopted last year. We went full throttle with the Lucy Calkins writing program. And, uh, uh, you know, 
When you are having success with the things that you're using, sometimes it's hard to get people to change, you know, to something that is so totally different. And so, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of opposition, but it was difficult for some people to kind of tuck away some of the things that, that they used all these years. And then so we just went full throttle with the Lucy Calkins program, adopted the, uh, you know, Eureka program, Full Blast, which... Uh, I think it first gave us all kind of agita and you know we're a little bit nervous about you know what would the end results be but there was a constant analysis too about you know what were the modules that might be taught after the test that we need to make sure we teach before the test you know so that the kids had learned what you know uh, uh, they would be tested on so there was a lot of work done on that I think again like this year like some of my colleagues have said to see kids understand the language of Eureka and uh, it's making it a lot easier, a lot easier on children but also on teachers, you know, which is great. Uh, so uh, with, the, uh, with the science, I think what we're doing is we're now we're going to look, we didn't do the overall review that, that uh, we normally did in fifth grade because, you know, it's a culmination of all the grades you know, that the kids are tested on in fifth. So we used to have a massive uh, uh, a review, you know, throughout fifth grade on concepts and things, you know, just to kind of get the kids to recall certain things. And because of the new programs and the time ded dedicated to those programs, we didn't really necessarily spend the time on science. But we've already started to look at the new standards. You know, uh, Cara has helped us with that. And uh, we're starting to develop, you know, lessons and things like that that need to be taught, you know, grades one through five. Uh, our highest 75% of students achieved 78% uh, of targets. And so now we're looking at, and we've started looking at, like, that top 25% of kids. And, like, we're finding that even though there was growth with those students, you know, the growth was probably minimum to, uh, you, know, you know, when we compare that to our lowest 25%. So what we need to do is we need to look at what are some of the things that we need to do for that upper crust of children, you know, to kind of really push them, you know, further in their thinking, maybe their knowledge, you know, of a particular item. So uh, we've already, in fifth grade and fourth grade, uh, you know, uh, the teachers have come up with uh, some unique challenges, you know, for the students and things like that to expand their learning. So, so to that end, I mean, I'm very happy with, you know, uh, the results this year. I, I'm be honest with you, we're really nervous because of all the new programs and things like that. But uh, it just shows that, you know, I mean, I'm like one of the happiest guys going to work every day. It's so nice to be able to go in and, and be with the staff, the teachers, the uh, TAs that I'm working with. Uh, the students are, are all there, you know, very ambitious, ready to learn. And, I mean, enough can't be said about the uh, PTO and the, the parents, you know, and, uh, you know, what they give back to the school. So, again, it's, it was a good year last year. I just want to point out one thing um, for the record, which is interesting, is Kittredge uses the same reporting system for attendance as all the other elementary schools, and you saw a four out of four and a three out of four, and then you saw some zeros out of four, um, and we have high, you know, we can get the numbers, but we have high attendance. So the state, uh, this being a new system, they're not going to go back and change any of this, I can mm -hmm. guarantee you that. Um, but I think in the future, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they send us out this report and then give us time to have a discrepancy period uh, is how mm -hmm. they used to do it. Um, but there's some work to be done um, because there's no difference in how he collects in reports attendance versus Franklin, which was zero for four. And, you know, you had a group that was four for four and three for four. So mm -hmm. just thought I'd mention that. <coughs> All right, so sergeant school. Um, the accountability percentile was 76, um, and this means that Sargent ranked higher than 75% of the other elementary schools in Massachusetts. 
Um, Sargent School met 81% of their growth targets last year, and you can see how this compares to the 43% of students meeting their targets for the district. Uh, this side, slide shows how our growth was calculated for all students at Sargent School, and all students met 88% of their targets. And then on this slide, the blue bar represents the progress toward meeting targets for all students, and the red bar represents the lowest 25% of students and how they're progressing towards meeting the targets. So at Sargent School, all students met 88% of their targets, were, which we're really excited about, and our lowest 25% of students met 74% of their targets. And then um, this slide shows how the progress towards meeting target indicators is calculated for that lowest 25% of students. And um, we noted that looking at this particular slide, for ELA, the population earned the four out of four. So we were excited about that piece. And then this particular slide ties it all together, all this information. Um, so it's the average for the total of all students and then um, the lowest 25% of students and um, Sargent has met 81% of their targets for the spring 2018 testing. Okay, so our successes. Um, last year we worked really, really hard um, with growth mindset and we believe that this shared understanding definitely contributed to our MCAS achievements. We had 58% of students meet or exceed expectations in ELA, and that was an increase from 49% in 2017, so we felt as though that was a, a huge growth. 52% um, of our students met or exceeded expectations in math, and that was an increase from 48% in 2017. And then uh, fifth grade met 74% of their targets in ELA and 61% of their targets in math, so uh, we're definitely highlighting that growth also. Um, and of course, we have areas to work on. So 9% of the students with disabilities group met or exceeded expectations in ELA, and 15% of the economically disadvantaged subgroup met or exceeded expectations in math. So obviously, those are a few areas we want, excuse me, want to work on. Um, so we're continuing to do what everybody else has mentioned. We're collaborating with the central office, uh, with the coaches, with the coordinators. Um, we're encouraging teachers to start doing peer observations. It's something that we really, really are hoping that they start to do. We want them to get into each other's classrooms and learn from each other. It's obviously one of the best resources. Um, additionally, we've established a school-wide goal of increasing students' growth in reading um, by using running records. So Kristen Ando has been great. We've had a first round of running record training. We're going to use that as a consistent tool among all of our teachers. Um, and we're able to identify with those, the strengths and weaknesses, and then we can do small instructional reading groups based on um, those results. And so Kristen's coming back in a couple weeks and we're starting a second round of that. So um, we've been working hard on that. So overall, we are so excited from where we were a year ago at this point. Um, Karen Leahy, I can't say enough about how much she's really gotten the staff to pull together and work really hard. So, and I'm handing it over to Chris Thompson. George and I have the unenviable task of being the last two people to go in this presentation, so we'll Should try to Thompson keep it go going. First, it's Albert E. Thompson. Yeah. I don't know. It goes with the T, Gilly. It goes with the T. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we will, we will keep it going as the last two folks here. Um, so you've, these slides are going to be very familiar to you at this point. Thompson was at 50. Thompson was at 56. And uh, again, the district progress towards improvement targets was 43, and Thompson was at 78. Again, here you have the slide of the breakdown of all the students. Um, and we were 86%, uh, um, which we were, we were very happy about um, that number, um, and particularly up at the top, um, all of our students, ELA, um, and math and science, those are some uh, good numbers up at the top there in the achievement total. Uh, so you see the district uh, progress towards meeting targets for all students and the lowest 25%. And then on the right again, uh, Thompson School, the blue representing our progress for all students at 86%. And then our progress towards meeting targets for our lowest 25% of our students, which was at 70%. And the culmination, uh, oh, not yet. This is the lowest, go ahead. 
the sorry the lowest 25 percent students um, and what's interesting uh, that we noted about this slide uh, in looking at the data I should say is when you look up at the top at the ELA achievement our lowest 25 percent of students earn their points um, which we were very happy about again you see that uh, oh go to the next slide sorry here we go. Um, so again, the culmination slide for the achievement growth um, and the additional indicators. So on the left, again, all of our students at 86%. On the right, our lowest performing students at 70%, meeting our targets at 78. And um, again, you're going to see that um, absenteeism number pop up. In this case, it's popping up for some of our lowest performing students. Um, and we've talked a lot about this in terms of absenteeism and as Dr. Gilligan said it's recorded it's looked at the same way in all the schools uh, Mr. Cushing alluded to things like you know calling students after a couple of days you working with the school nurse the school guidance counselor there's a lot of factors that go into it so this is a number we're going to continue to explore it's actually something um, I've been looking at even prior to this number coming out now, last year when we did our open house we talked a lot about national research data that talks about over 15 school days out in a year can start to have a dramatic impact on student achievement um, so there's national data on this and so it's something that we're we're looking at um, for our students going forward we'll be talking about it a little bit more just in terms of how we're coding things and what we do when kids are out it's really a blend of you know being supportive but also making sure uh, folks realize school attendance is important and it does have an effect on achievement in the long run and we're setting up those habits early on. Um, so our successes in areas of opportunity. Um, so all of our students made 86 percent progress towards our improvement targets um, and uh, we were happy that the lowest 25 percent of our students met 70 percent of their improvement targets and as you've heard earlier um, we are uh, we have been and we will continue to dig into that data to take a look at what students are we talking about, uh, what interventions do we have in place, what services are we providing for those students. Um, and then we, we looked very thoughtfully and carefully also as everyone has at all the different uh, reports where you can look at your subgroups and I thought it was worth pointing out um, that almost all of our subgroups um, met or exceeded their improvement targets. So for example, 99% uh, of our Hispanic or Latino students met their targets and it was a, it was a, it was a pretty large group actually um, and 80% of our students with disabilities made progress towards improvement targets which we were really happy to see. Um, there are always areas for opportunity and areas that we need to work on um, and some interesting things that we saw in the data included our lowest performing students and interestingly enough our white students improved their achievement so their achievement was improved um, but as we uh, begin to digest this data and and understand what it means uh, targets were set for them so while they improved they were still below the targets that were set for this year so we'll be continuing to look at that um, we've actually already started working um, specifically in fourth and fifth grade with Ms. Ando on some other reports that we ran to take a look at a comparison of kids last year from this year um, and their risk factors based on testing um, and whether they were low risk, medium risk or high risk and which kids we were talking about and there was some uh, interesting things that came out of that and the teachers ate it up. They were just really happy um, to see that data and kind of think about their own instruction. Um, chronic absenteeism has come up uh, repeatedly so that's an area that we're going to continue to explore we're going to continue to look at um, it came up for our students with disabilities and interestingly some of our white students so um, as a whole group so we're going to take a look at that and we'll be continuing to talk together as a group and, and see what that means for each of us um, and then again you know our overall accountability percentile for Thompson is at 56 percent um, I would like that number to be higher but I, I want to qualify it by saying I was <laughs> thrilled to see the progress towards improvement at 78 percent and 86 percent um, for me that statistic is extremely meaningful in terms of where we're taking the kids in a year and where they're going to go in the future so 
Um, we, we have uh, a number of different subgroups at Thompson, um, as Greg alluded to earlier at Atkinson. Um, there's a number of challenges um, in terms of uh, poverty um, and, and different groups, and a lot of our groups did really well. Um, so I would, f I would fully expect in the future that that number is going to continue to climb, but the fact that 78% of the students move towards improvement targets, um, that's a good number and I was really happy to see that. And that means that w we are moving most of our students a year or more growth. And when we consider that a lot of our students are, many of them are pretty far behind, that's significant growth. Um, a couple of other things I just want to say kind of in closing before I turn it over to George. Um, I really want to thank our, our staff at Thompson. We, we did a lot of work last year with our new schedule. Um, they're, they've been really working a lot on collaborating together. Um, it's been mentioned, the coaching cycles that we've had, and our teachers, even our first and second grade teachers, have been really happy to take a look at that data and what it means for them. So I think the 78% progress towards improvement is no accident. I think it's some thoughtful work, um, high quality instruction that's going on at the Thompson School from our staff, um, both our existing staff and some of the staff that we've hired and we continue to hire. So I want to give them a shout out for all their hard work each and every day. And just on a separate topic, I want to thank Lorene and Gilly and Jim for um, supporting Thompson and the North Andover community through the recent gas issues. We estimate that we probably still have 40 to 50 percent of our families that do not have gas at this time. Um, so uh, we still have families in hotels. Um, and you can imagine that that's a big challenge to get your child to school every day when you're living in Burlington or Woburn or somewhere else. Um, so I really, you know, publicly want to thank our parents for getting the kids to school as best they can. We've had a number of parents who have told us, I'm sorry, I can't get here before quarter and nine. Um, and, you know, we're like, whatever you need. But thanks to the district and thanks to all of you for supporting us. And, you know, as we speak, some of them continue to get turned on. So hopefully by the holidays, they'll be there. So thank you. And before we go to middle school principal uh, George Gonzalez, um, I think it's important, I'm not sure how many people on the school committee know, but under the Massachusetts general law, every district has to have a supervisor of attendance. In the old days, they called it a truancy officer. <laughs> um, and it cannot be a police officer. You know, we used to use our school resource officers um, as the attendants. We've hired a retired police officer, officer, uh, former Tracy. officer, Tracy Castiglione. Um, and for those that don't know, she works part time for us uh, and she's relentless. Uh, in terms of tracking down absent kids. Uh, she only does a day, day and a half, two days a week um, and receives a stipend first, but she's been in that role three years now, three or four years now, and um, I just think she's a real asset to the community and it's not someone we've ever talked about here or publicly, so. You want to go right to middle school? Mm -hmm. then Let's we'll go to NAMS. So, um, so what you see here is our ac accountability percentile. Uh, before I dive into MCAS, give you a little respite uh, from MCAS, and let me just say that uh, it continues to be my honor and privilege to be principal of NAMS. Um, wonderful parents, amazing staff, and just great kids. So it uh, continues to be my pro uh, honor and privilege to be principal there. Uh, this 63, uh, as you know, means uh, we did better than 62% of the other middle schools in uh, the Commonwealth. Unlike prior MCAS exams, this new MCAS 2.0 exams compares apples to apples. Uh, middle schools prior to this MCAS exam were compared with anyone who had grades six through eight in their population. Now it compares middle schools to middle schools. Oh, so this great. puts us at about a rank of 73 out of 237 middle schools in the Commonwealth. Um, the next slide talks about our progress towards meeting targets. Um, I know we're asked not to compare our results to 2017, yet 
it's all in the data. We're being compared to 2017. Mm -hmm. Targets are measured by how you did compared to 2017. Right. So it's a little confusing for me how we're not supposed to compare to 2017, yet we're constantly compared to 2017, which was a different exam. And we shouldn't be surprised that uh, more students or even the same number of students did not meet or exceed expectations. It's a different test, and I dare say it's a more challenging, difficult test. Um, that 26% you see, you saw all the percentages from all the other schools, so that makes sense. <laughs> so how is it that the district is 43? We'll take all the schools, average them out, and that's how you get 43. <coughs> but that 26% is the average of the aggregate and the lowest 25%, which I'll, I'll get into in a minute. If you look at that next slide, it talks about points earned. How do they figure that out? Well. What they do is they take achievement, and that is the average scaled score, what, how kids did, and it's the average. Then they take student growth, well, that's the SGP. That's the student growth percentile. You, to be even included in an SGP, you had to have taken uh, the MCAS test for two successive years at the same school. So for us, sixth graders are never, are, well, they can be included in SGP, um, but they haven't been at NAMS for two years, but our seventh and eighth graders have. And then you have this English proficiency um, target. Well, you need 20 students who are EL students who take MCAS. So if um, Greg has 25 students in his school who are EL students, but only 19 took MCAS, he doesn't get those scores. Those scores don't count. Well, if those scores don't count and it's out of 100, how do they do that? Well, achievement, instead of being worth 60%, is now worth 67.5. Growth, instead of being 20%, is worth 22.5. You get no credit for how your EL students performed. And then the chronic absenteeism still counts for 10%. And that is percentage of students missing 10% or more days in membership. So that's 18 days a year. I looked at the NAMS percentages, and it doesn't look right. So this is definitely something we need to explore. It, it, if, I, I swear, there's a lot of kids at NAMS every day, a lot. So I don't know where they're hiding, if they just skip home room, um, but there might be a question of how we're recording attendance uh, because we're missing some numbers here or there. So we have to look at that. But how those points are derived, it's basically this simple. The state sets targets for you. If you exceed those targets, you get four points. If you meet those targets, you get three. If you improve, you get two. If you don't change, you get one. And if you decline, you get zero. So anytime you see a zero, it means that we declined from 2017 in that area. So what you see there is how NAMS did aggregate all students on all of those areas. Obviously, we don't get any points for English language proficiency because we didn't have uh, 20 students. This year, right now, as of today, we have 16 EL students, which means we won't get a number for that um, next year. Um, October 1st is long gone, so um, that, that, that's where they use the data. The next slide, it looks at the um, lowest 20% uh, in comparison. Um, you can see how we did there. Next slide. And then here is the lowest performing students and how, what they earned for points. So the lowest performing students, they are determined based on being in your school for two successive years and taking MCAS. So when we get the 25% the of kids who the state has deemed are our 25% lowest performing students, there will be no sixth graders in that group they will be comprised of seventh and eighth graders because our sixth graders, um, their results were from last year. Our sixth grade results from last year, um, from the year before, plus uh, this past year's, um, that's how they do it. So, so it's, it's a target group, but it would only be comprised of seventh and eighth graders coming up. So that's something we'll absolutely be looking at. So then when you average the two, 
there you go, 37% for the aggregate, 14% for the lowest performing. So the average of that is 26%. That puts NAMs in partially meeting targets. Schools that are between 0 to 74% are partially meeting. Schools that are in 75 to 100% are meeting targets. And not, not indicated there would be, um, it used to be called commendation schools. Um, schools of recognition is what it's called now, and then the lowest uh, performing schools are schools requiring assistance or intervention. Uh, no schools in North Andover Public Schools are even near <laughs> that lowest 15% area. So really it's a matter of how do we continue to build? How do we continue to grow? Um, having baseline data like this doesn't worry me at all. To be honest, as a new principal, I, I'd really like bit low baseline data. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm very much looking uh, to build upon that. Um, the work of Laureen, Kristen, and Kara, I put their names up there to recognize them and to thank them for their ongoing data analysis. They have been able to dive into MCAS, and it makes me feel like I've only scratched the surface. And they've met with staff. As I realized today, it looks like they've met with everyone in a district based on what all the principals have shared. I don't know if they sleep at night. Um, and I've been in attendance at many of their meetings, and they've been eye-opening. Uh, the staff have received them extraordinarily warmly. And um, I have a wonderful staff, an amazing staff who are very eager and excited to uh, improve instruction, improve student performance, get to know kids, connect with kids, and combine that with data analysis and inserting good instruction, and we should have amazing results. Our academic coordinators uh, continue to work with their departments, um, looking at data, looking at instruction, sharing best practices, um, so that's something we'll continue to do in grade level content area meetings as well. Okay, here we go. We talked at that last meeting about taking a look at this and trying this and doing that. Here's what I've done. Let's look at student work. How are you doing that? Well, I taught it this way. Well, I taught it this way. Um, how can we share um, our, this work together? So that's ongoing. Every staff member at NAMS has um, selected student learning goals and professional practice goals around standard two of the educator evaluation rubric, which um, to, to summarize it is really meeting the needs of all learners, differentiating instruction to meet kids where they are and take them to the next level. Every single staff member at NAMS has chosen um, goals in that area, and they will be working collectively as grade levels and departments and as a school in finding new and different ways to meet the needs of our learners. Um, we don't want to leave anyone behind. Um, and then we continue to identify um, that while well, we're waiting to hear who that 25% is, but in the meantime, we know who our students are who are um, struggling a little bit, who need more interventions and remediations, because the best lessons usually will hit about 85% of the kids. So it's not to be surprised when 15% need more, it's to expect it, it's to anticipate it, and to have a plan in place to meet those kids. So that's what staff are doing. And then also identifying ways to improve student attendance. We're leaving points on the table. We're leaving points on the table. Something's going on, and we got to figure that out. And a um, no, message needs to be shared with parents about the importance of attendance to make sure our kids are there. It's kind of hard to teach when they're not there. Yeah, and, and you can't just simply give them a worksheet when they get back. I mean, they missed that great joke we told, but, you know, that story, that anecdote. You can't replicate that. And um, so I'm excited. I'm hopeful. Um, I'm happy with this low baseline, uh, nowhere to go but up from here, and I, I'm going to go on a limb and say next year you're going to see significant growth, growth at, my, at NAMS for sure. All right. Questions? How, how do we want to do this? Because there's a lot of stuff here. It, it feels like different sets of questions for the elementaries and NAMS. Could we maybe start with NAMS and go backwards? Sure. Um, go around once with NAMS and then go around again? Sure. Okay. I have just one pretty simple question. 
um, which is you, you talked about department meetings uh, led by academic coordinators. What are the departments at NAMS? Are you talking about like do all the science teachers get together or is it by team? Or uh, does... We have academic coordinators for science, math, social studies, English, and related arts. Okay. And then we also have um, special ed director Susan Donatel who works with the special ed department. So all departments are represented, all departments have leaders, and depending on what we're working on, departments will combine, as special education will often combine with other departments, or they'll work individually. So it's, so it's, both, it, it's primarily vertical? Vertical, six to eight. Okay. And then during our schedule, we have a lot of time for teams to meet, and one right. day a cycle, um, our content area teachers meet. So all the grade seven math teachers meet together. And those are times that often I'll jump into their meetings, schedule myself to look at data with them. That's when um, uh, Chris, um, Kristen has come and met, um, Kara has come and met, Lorene has come and met, et cetera. Thank you for that reminder of that structure. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I have a couple things, uh, sure. questions. So first, um, if we're seeing a lot of zeros in the achievement area, but then we see growth of twos and threes, does that mean we're growing to, like, are, are, that we're so far below that to even get any kind of achievement? Uh, how, how are we growing but not achieving? I don't understand how that works. Wh I don't know if you have an answer to that, but those numbers don't make any sense to me. Which, which numbers? So, um, a lot of them. <laughs> below is 25%. So if you have, or, or even if you look at everybody, okay. you've got um, English language arts, you've got achievement zero, mm -hmm. but growth two. Uh. So Wait, uh, I don't understand mm -hmm, how those numbers mm -hmm. go together. So uh, achievement is the <laughs> scaled scores, average all their scale scores, and basically what it tells you is um, what percentage of students were um, exceeding or are meeting expectations. Mm -hmm. So we were pretty much the same percentage. However, um, now you go into SGP, student growth percentile. So what happens is how you performed on MCAS last year, let's say you, you got a 500 on it, and then um, the year before you got a 500 on it, even though they didn't give 500s. That puts you into a group, a cohort. Every single kid your age in the state who was in that 500 range is lumped into a cohort. Right. Got that. Uh, let's to make it easy. Let's say there's exactly a hundred of them, mm -hmm. and then the next MCAS. Here's your cohort. Here's your pack, and y how you performed will give you a rating between one and a hundred, a percentile. If you're at 50, it means 40. You did better than 49 kids, and uh, f uh, you know 49 kids uh, did better than you. Okay. Um, an SGP between 40 and 60 means you're running with the pack. That's good. Our SGP at NAMS is solid. It's between 40 and 60. Our kids are continuing to run with the pack. They're not running ahead of the pack. They're running with the pack. And something I didn't mention was that we are consistently in all areas above the state average. So. But so if you're running with the pack, what number between either the achievement or the growth is showing? Like I, I don't. The SGP shows that achievement does it because you didn't you didn't improve. Yet if you get the same score, uh, if you're in the meeting expectations year in and year out, well the test is harder. It's the next grade level. You had to have learned a year's worth of content. You got the same score. Right. That's good. They're actually asking that we go even beyond that. Right. So, yeah. so that, what you're just saying, that would be the growth information. But then what's the achievement information? Um, how many percentage of students who scored uh, partially meeting, meeting, exceeding, right. not meeting. So that's pretty stagnant. Yeah. Yeah, if you remember last year, we looked at the graph about, so last year, the state celebrated being number one in the nation, leading the nation right. number one. But half of our kids didn't meet expectations in the Commonwealth. And this year, uh, and Kristen, you know these numbers off the top of your head, mm -hmm. it's just a little above half, not much. They're in the 50s mm -hmm. again. So, you know, 45%, 48% of every kid in Massachusetts is not meeting expectations. I think that's important to know. I think I can help a little bit with your question. <coughs> Do you know, any, I don't even know what my question is, but I don't understand. <laughs> no, because it doesn't, if, does this mean like you, you're, you're achieving nothing, but you've grown? I don't understand. So the slide that's up here, um, so if you look at the first indicator, yep. English language arts achievement, 
So at NAMS last year, what they do is they average all the scaled scores together like it's one child. Mm -hmm. And so let's say the average scaled score was 450. The state would set a target based on this big scientific format that set a target that they would want um, NAMS to be at 455. So that number, zero out of four, mm -hmm. is how much progress you, to you made toward meeting that target of getting even better. And, and that's so the achievement number. That would be achievement okay. number, yep. And so, and the, the state has set a target for all of those numbers. And so if it looks like at NAMS, that number actually declined. The average skill score went from 450 to 449, giving zero points. So that's, so it's progress toward meeting your achievement target. Okay. And then George was right about the growth. Right, right. Where that's about like, let's, let's say last year your growth was 48. The state says this year it should be 52. Right. You might get assigned, you know, you say you landed at 50. Right. The state might assign you two points because you incrementally earned two out of four points getting closer to that target. Okay. That a four out of four would be that you exceeded your target, that you well right. surpassed. Right. Um, your target and so it's confusing but the it's the achievement is the goal the state set for you achievement wise okay and then the, so do you all feel that one of these numbers is more valuable to you the, the achievement or the growth or is it the whole package you, you move up everything follows it, it's it's you 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 um, go down you get penalized in every area you go up you make points in every area. And the SGP target across the state is 50%. So 49% of the state will always be below target. So that's just how they set up the formula. So as we move up, everyone will follow. But what this, what this really shows is you can't ignore any group. You can't focus on your lowest performing. You can't just focus on your high. You have to focus on everyone. All yeah. students, right? Yeah. To the DESE site, um, would we be able to see like bar charts of our, you know, achievement and our student growth percentile? Like those are the charts that we're used to looking at, and I know we're not supposed to compare them. And I think this is very valuable, but it would be helpful to me and perhaps some of the viewing public to be able to go on to some place that would have they the familiar. Do, they do have some bar charts that compare from last year. We originally had those in the presentation we had prepared for. Um, Two weeks ago, we were, our group was here, but then because um, Greg read that in his beginning piece, the training that Chris and I went yeah. to said, do not compare. So originally, we had right. them up there, and we thought it just gets, it gets a little confusing and messy, so we just made that determination to start right. fresh. But yes, you could go. There yeah. are some bar jobs there. Ta yeah. Thanks. And to answer your question, we, we have access to something called Edwin Analytics. Um, so... You know, I have like a master code that can do the entire district. They have codes for their schools. Um, Kristen and Lorene have master codes, Donna. Um, but there's a public Edwin Analytics that you can go to. Uh, anyone can go to. It, and that's what you want to look for on the DESE website. And it's really some cool stuff. Cool Thanks. Stuff, so. All right, two other questions. One is, um, so I think you mentioned when you came in before that you heard from parents. Some parents said, gosh, we want more homework. Some parents said, not enough, mm -hmm. no more homework. Some parents said, and I've heard this as well, that there's great inflation at the middle school, that everybody gets 100, and I know we want kids to feel good that they're achieving, so we don't want them to you know, be giving them 74s or all the stuff that you get when they're older. But so the challenge is how do you marry the fact that someone gets A pluses and then they have a terrible MCAS. Like, is there a breakdown between those things? Um, and, and because of that, are we preparing kids for when they get to the high school that they suddenly are like, oh my gosh, I was just like A-plus student, and now I'm getting like Bs and Cs, and like, what the heck happened? Whereas nothing happened, it's just they're measured differently. I'm, yeah. I'm just curious. So, so um, the conversation on homework, you know, I, I plan on uh, having a conversation with Laureen about homework and also talking to my staff about it. And uh, in, in regards to uh, grade inflation, well, it all depends on how you give grades. And, um, it, you know, if our jobs as educators is to educate students, that doesn't mean that we're the bus that goes by once and doesn't 
come by again that if you miss the bus don't worry another bus is coming by uh, you didn't learn that material come back after school let's learn it right. oh but I'm not going to give you any credit no I'll give you credit right. for that you did it you learned it you should be recognized so I would expect there should be grade inflation because um, it really shows that the students came back and learned it and we don't give up on them and, and we don't say well them. too bad I'm not teaching that anymore I'm moving on regardless of where where you are it's like a shepherd who ends the day missing 22 sheep oh well you know and you can't right. do that so um, but but it's it's all about a conversation and and I'll just share this I know we're, we're short on time but I remember uh, seeing this Canadian report card that I absolutely loved it was you get a grade for content area only and that's only content area but then you get these number grades for homework completion effort participation meeting deadlines so if you're that child who, as far as content, maybe is getting a C plus, but you're ones everywhere, you're working your tail off. Good yeah, job. For that. And how about the student whose parents see A's and they think everything's fine? And they're doing nothing. But they're doing nothing. So as a parent, you know what you have to focus in on too. Right. And as an employer, I think I'd hire that B ones over that A fours. So it, it's right. just something to think about. And 21st exactly. century skills are part of that. No, and that's why I bring it up because we do hear parents say, like, well, I don't understand. How yeah. could this be? <coughs> and so, um, and they, when they look at the MCAS, if they freak out because yeah. they use that as a big measure. And then my last thing was, um, so, where did it come from? So the, I think it was the lowest 25 percent. So does, how do you think, or are, are 504s and implementing things like that, things that you're looking at to help with that? Because I know there's a lot of that in the middle, uh, the elementary schools and the middle schools, we're starting to move a little bit um, into a different way we handle the 504s. Is there any value or consideration in, in any I of that? I think it's a completely different process. Um, you know, when you, when you think about a child with a disability, a disability doesn't automatically mean they can't access the curriculum without specially designed instruction. It just means, oh, this is the disability. Oh yeah, um, this manifests in a classroom this way. That's all right. I'm using these instructional strategies and teaching strategies. And a lot of times, good teaching. I mean, if you look at PLEP A's on IEPs, you look at the list of what teachers have to do. Ninety percent of it is just good teaching. You know, like break down um, tasks into small parts. Um, what teacher doesn't do that? Or I hope all teachers do that, actually. Don't answer that I, question. All right, sorry. That would be um, something to look at. Yeah, so, so it's, <laughs> it's all about good teaching meets the needs of all students where they're at. Yeah. Can I just dovetail on that? Can someone explain to you how, when, who determines the lowest 25%? How's that determined? The state does. The state does. But how? But how, but how? Uh, based on, so the state at every school, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could take a school that has the highest growth, highest performance in the state. They're still going to have within their school their lowest 25%. But what are they using to measure that? What are they measuring that? Rank like? order. You rank Average order. order. You, you, you guys no, no, the the way the kids performed. They're based ranked on their order. achievement, not based on their growth. Yes. Right. And based they on have to have been in the school yeah, for cool. two years. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that we don't look at their science scores. Is that correct? Science is fifth. Science and eighth grade. Fifth and eighth, and it's still uh, the antiquated test. Correct. So, for example, we've, at the middle school, we've implemented the new science standards six, seven, and eight in the past three years, yet um, the state told us to look into that and do that, but they're still using the old test until... 2020? 2020. No, I guess my question, look, look at all the charts. On the regular one, there's a science achievement, four out of four for Thompson, but it's dash, dash, it's dash, dash on every single... School. Why is that? Because in order to be part of that group, you have to have been <coughs> at the same school taking the same test for two years. Because our science test is only offered in fifth grade, mm -hmm. there would be no one in that group that it would have taken a science in test. Every two years in every single school? In every school in the Commonwealth. Because they only take it once in each school. Fifth grade, eighth grade, tenth grade, ninth so grade? Other areas measured against two. Yeah. Two um, years, two tests, same school. Okay. I'm just curious, Mr. Raymond, you're the only one in who had comments that talked about race, and I'm wondering why you, why you did that. I, well, I think um, part of it is we, we look at high need students, we look at the lowest 25%, but we also have a lot of breakdowns in terms of uh, race and so forth, and we actually had a subgroup of Hispanic students because it was a large enough group, so that's why I reported it out. 
I guess I'm they did really well. I'm not, I'm, I didn't understand what this is. Our lowest performing and white students improved their achievement, but they were below targets. Yep, so they, uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier. So they improved, um, but they were still below the target set by the state for them. Mm -hmm. So if there was a number set for them for this year, they approached that number, but they were a little bit below that number. So they improved from last year, but they were still a little bit below the number that was set for them for this year. Is that something we should be measuring for all the schools as well? And I see, I see what, why, why you did it, but. Uh, it depends on whether there's a cohort. Um, so yeah. the state yeah. determines cohorts, yeah. as Kristen was saying earlier, or um, uh, someone was mentioning earlier, you know, you get 20 in a cohort, uh, then it's reported less than that, yeah. it, it, you know, then it actually adjusts the scale in which they use, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, it, and it really all depends. I mean, um, you may have, you may be one kid short of cohort, or you may have, you know, or someone who's out on a medical, uh, out of school. Um, so, but um, certainly, um, as we know, with 103 EL students we serve. Mm -hmm. We know that most of them are Atkinson and then Thompson. Right. Uh, and it's you know. possible that, w you know, depending on the grades they're in, that may or may not get reported next year. Like we have um, EL students in the 20s, but not all those are in third, fourth, and fifth. So, mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't, that particular group wasn't reported. So as George said, uh, we don't get any um, credit in that area. So, and that therefore those numbers would have looked different. They would have been 60, 20, 10, 10, mm -hmm. instead of 67.5, 22.5. So while we have overall at the school the over 20, they're also looking at not all of those kids are taking the uh, MCAS test. Um, I guess to all of you, do you find this helpful at all, this information, or the way that they're scoring it? I, I mean, I'll just call it out. I mean, obviously, I have the kids school at 88 percent, and I got the Atkins school at 33 percent. I actually stood next to us at the polls on Tuesday, and I stood next to an Atkins school parent, and they were they were asking me, well, what does it mean? And I don't think, respectfully, I don't think kids school is that much greater. That uh, what what does it mean? What what do you tell parents? I mean, I'm just being honest about it. I mean. I'll be, I've, I've been involved with this for a long time. I was a former state rep when MCAS came online. And I just think this thing's been completely bastardized. I, do, I really do. I think it's been just grown for the sake of being grown. Um, and I'm just wondering if it's helpful. <coughs> you're the educators. You're on the front lines. Um, we need the kind of feedback. We're the policymakers. We're the ones who need to talk to our reps and senators. Um, has it gone too far? It, it, it's hard to be the one on the end where I'm talking about only outperforming 32 yeah. of the schools versus, you know, what my colleagues are sharing. So that's hard to think about when I know that my teachers are working just as hard as every other teacher that's in these, these buildings over here. And a lot of the things that Rich described and George described, it's like that's happening in my school too. So what's, what is with the execution of actually performing on that test that's, that's working and not working? Um, so, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, that's what everyone, people look at. Every one of our schools is unique, although we all teach in the sure. same community and work. Right. We have dynamics in our buildings that, that and factors that change, change day to day, you know. You know, mine could be the fluctuating um, population that comes in uh, each year that we've been looking into a lot over the last, and how does that impact performance and all that. Um, but you can't tell me his school is 87% better than, and yours is only 32% better than the rest of the, 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 the Commonwealth. That, you know, that's what these numbers say. These, these numbers say that uh, my school's underperforming is the way I look at it. But qualitatively, if you talk to parents in my school community and the kids in my school community, they're very, very happy and hardworking. So, I, I agree with you 100%, Greg. So, so I feel good about that. You know, I leave school every day feeling, feeling really good about that, and I wish these numbers would reflect some of that in a different way. What bothers me is, like, I, I think some of this stuff is just used for the wrong reason. I think realtors love this stuff. Hmm. They, they, they can pump up. I mean, the, my, my house value price went, went through the roof because I'm in the Kidder School District. Yeah. Can, can I just add, I just want to preface this. So I've spent a lot of time with the commissioner over the last year, the new commissioner who was in the arts. The commissioner has said this, we're hitting a reset button. And to quote him directly, he said, districts and schools need to take time to breathe and to assess this new system. And what he's saying is, I'm wiping out accountability, levels one through five. And I think 
what's most refreshing about hearing him this summer was, okay, this is a totally new system. Obviously, you can tell I think there's some bugs on their end, but let's not be afraid of this new stuff. This is the first year that gives us a baseline. So let's confront the reality of where that baseline is and then see what kind of progress we can make. Because right now, as a team, we have a collaboration goal as a district, um, as a leadership team. And this is our second year of collaboration. I know that the collaboration this year with Lorene, which is probably an upgrade to the assistant superintendent, uh, previously, uh, Kara and, 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 and Kristen. <laughs> but my point being is there's a lot of pieces in place. And I, I really think the last two pieces of it is, A, it's a snapshot in time. And then B, there are a lot of, I mean, it's a snapshot in time. There are a lot of factors. I mean, schools are unique. I look at Mr. Raymond's school and I see, you know, that he's 17% Hispanic and in Athens it's 20% Hispanic. You know, as a district, we're probably about 78, 79% white. Well, Atkinson is 58% white and Thompson 70% white. Uh, and those are different. But you have other schools with special education. How kids do on standardized tests are number determined. Number one, are you a special education student? Number two, are you an EL student? Um, well, so I, what I'd say is I think the whole state um, needs time to, I think this needs to be more. I think, it, it, you know, this is kind of like the beta testing. Right. And I think, do you guys remember when we took the MCAS 18 years ago for the first time? Well, I was just going to say, I, I remember, uh, I'm, I've been around long enough to remember when, in the 90s, when we did MCAS, there were several years in the beginning where we had these exact same discussions about the data and what it meant. And there was a lot of norming going on and a lot of tweaks to the tests and the test items. I, I suspect the same thing is going to happen this time because there were some changes to the test this year um, from before. But, you know, Dr. Gilligan mentioned a snapshot, and I've always believed as a school leader that this is one piece, but it's not the only piece. Mm -hmm. nope. There are it several pieces of data that we can and should be looking at. And um, one of the big things that's going on in this district that we should all be proud of with our staff is the collaboration that we've set, set up through the contract for our teachers. That's a chance to be able to look at all the pieces and put them together for teachers so they can really look at and reflect on what does it mean for my instruction, um, what does it mean in my work with my colleagues, what does it mean for this student, how is that different for this student, because we have a lot of other data points that we look at. So this is, this is a piece, this is important data, we, we look at it, we're, I think we're all still trying to understand it and wrap our head around what the numbers mean. Um, but we have other data points too to help us understand uh, and get a more complete picture of students. So I think I want to reassure you that it's, I, I, I think we all believe it's faulty just to look at this for each child. We have to look at all the other things that go into our students and it's everything from their social emotional learning to the map data we have to their attendance data to their how they even you know do on running records as, as Aaron mentioned and, and and do they raise their hand in class do they participate like there's so many things that go behind kids each day when they come to our school so this is a piece and this is an important piece but there are lots of other important pieces that we look at so I, I, I know that and I truly believe that and, and I, you know like, like I said, I've seen this thing grow over the years, and it gets as disturbing. And, and I do have a lot of confidence in, in the new commissioner. I think he, he understands it, um, that this is a work in progress. But, you know, 20 years ago, North River Moms didn't exist. You know, pe <laughs> this, you know people in this day and age, they need the, the social, they, they, need, they need instant gratification. They need instant analysis. What does it mean? And um, I feel bad that this number jumps off the page, you compared to you. So. You know, as proud as I am of Kittredge School, mm -hmm. I, I, my kids love it there, and I'm, I'm a proud graduate myself of, of Kittredge School. Um, well, I just well, don't want to see. I, I just know, don't want to see that. us, you know, bragging about this or worrying about that. I mean, we're all in this together, and I think that's most important. I, I love the collaboration, and, and the, the comments here about you and Kara and Kristen are, are phenomenal. So we need to keep that up, and let's not. These are kind of numbers we shouldn't really. Well, focus David, on. I think that's one of the things that, as principals, we were really concerned about because we don't want, you know, we work very collaboratively together, you know, with what we're doing at our schools, you know, sharing ideas, sharing, you know, what we're doing with students, how we're getting teachers to develop new instruction, 
And now here we are comparing 33% to 88%. It's wrong. We should look at what we're doing. Why are we sitting here doing this right now then? David, really? It's, well, it's it's in the public domain. I, 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 we I need to explain you. it a little bit, but sure. I, sure. I don't I don't like it. So I just what? want to finish up with NAMS, and then I know we have questions for Ellen. <laughs> <Sorry, Elijah's laughs> <going to. laughs> you went rogue, right? <laughs> she started it. I no, she didn't. She went rogue. She went rogue. Any other philosoph philosophical ideas around them? Yeah, I know. Um, so two questions, George. I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked Chet. Once you identify those lowest performing students, then what? So uh, once we identify those students, it's uh, ident uh, sharing that information with their teams, with the staff, um, taking a close look at their data um, in comparison to what we've identified for the school. So um, you can look at a school, a subgroup, and see how they did on certain standards. You really don't want to look at specific MCAS questions because they're not going to ask the same question again, especially if you can see it. That question won't be used again. Again. and the ones they'll use again you can't see so you really want to see how they did on standards and then take a look at our curriculum when do we teach that um, it, specifically when we look at some math wow we taught that after MCAS so we didn't do well on that question because we actually didn't really focus in on that so it's identifying that and now compare that to the how the lowest performing students are doing and does this need a, a little bit of work or should we really develop more of a mini unit on this concept or skill and where can we revisit it over the course of the year so that the students if they didn't necessarily master it here no worries we're going to see it again and again and again it's going to permeate so it's easier to do that in writing so um, you know there's a there's a type of writing narrative writing um, you know we can do better on so let's see how much how much narrative writing we can include over the course of the year and in other subjects too so that's how you, you get work smarter not harder kind of thing so that's our plan Okay, and then my second question is, obviously you're new, so you have yeah. a chance to just have a clean slate and do whatever you want. So what are your plans for the... I can't do whatever <laughs> I want, Holly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what types of things are you going to implement for all students? So I feel like we've already have. So just being very open and transparent with staff to say, let's um, let's be in this together. Um, and I was very transparent when I said to staff, you know, the reason why I'm asking you to all have shared goals is just to make sure we're all talking to each other and we have a reason to talk to each other and we have a purpose in looking at student work. That alone, when you remove the isolation of teaching and we start sharing and talking and what if we do this and what if we do that amazing things happen in preparation for my staff meeting next week I met with my assistant principals yesterday I thought I had a good plan it was nowhere near what it was when we left because we all brainstormed and came up with ideas teachers when they do that come up with fabulous lessons because they're able to throw ideas around and what if you did this what if you did that that would work that won't and um, it's really about that just building that collaboration among staff they're great people, yeah. I know one of the things that Sargent did last year and seems to have worked very well is you shadowed other schools, mm -hmm. right? Is there an opportunity for yeah. you to do that? So Chet and I, um, we got together a few times this summer, again during uh, uh, the fall. Uh, where I know they're, they're really busy with NEASC, but he's dedicated some time where we do want to do some 612 collaboration. We absolutely want to provide opportunities for staff to visit one another. Um, as evaluators, I want to go back to teaching. Do you know how many great lessons, how many ideas I've learned that I could now apply? And we want to create those opportunities for our staff, too, through the learning walks, through walkthroughs. As a district, we continue to do them. NAMS just hosted this past Monday. It feels Monday, like, yeah, it feels so like weeks ago it was, yeah. But this past Monday, we visited <laughs> classes, yeah. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Helen, do you have questions for elementary? Yeah, I have, I have a few questions. Again, kind of a general clarifying question. I know that the t lowest 25% doesn't include anybody who has been there less than two years. Does the all number include people who have been there less than two years? So when we're looking at, for example, um, Atkinson, you have tremendous growth in your students that are, that are in the lowest 25. So you've been working with them for a couple of years. I, I got clarification on the, the 
Lois 25 from Kristen earlier this week. That was very appreciative, very helpful to me. Um, so what you're doing with kids that have been sticking around is great. Um, so I wonder if that, um, if that all number, when those all numbers are lower, is that because you've got a lot of kids that have just moved into the district and, and you haven't had time to work with them, you know, how, how those numbers might be affected. Um, I don't expect that you'll have an answer with That's that right now, but I, but I think it's worth it. Exactly. I do have one comment on that. So and, uh, if you move into this district after October 1st, you will count in the all number but you won't count, um, you know, in the suburbs. That's what right. I was just saying. Right. She said, oh, I thought you said yeah. You'll count for the district. No, you the all. Count the school. You'll count for the district, not the school. Right. Helen, I think that's interesting. We were just saying that's a, that would be a thing for us to go back and take a look at because um, a lot of us have a lot of in and out. And so that's, you know, we, we actually, after you said that, we were sitting here saying, hmm, that's kind of interesting. We should, I think that's an important consideration because there is some in and out, so. Yeah. Mm. It's actually more. We went back and looked at it through the end of the year last year. So um, already this year we have 20, 29 new students who started since the end of the school year last year. So 29 um, additions to classrooms, and we had 22 students leave. So there's like a net of seven, but there's. Um, you know, a lot of changes to class lists and, you know, thinking about teaching and learning. But over the two previous years, it actually was the same number, 125 ins and outs. <coughs> with, um, one year, 85 new kids coming. This doesn't include kindergarten when we had kindergarten. 85 new kids coming into the rosters um, and 40 who left. And the, the year before was 79 new students and 46 leaving. I mean, those fluctuations really matter when it comes to continuity and consistency and you know, where teachers pick up every day, you know, and what, what, what some, some of those challenges are. Well, I mean, and you're, you're, we know in organizational growth that you're only as, as developed as your newest member. Yeah. So when you have a classroom that you have new kids coming in every day, it's, it's a, just a different teaching challenge. Yeah. It's not an excuse, and we're obviously no. helping all those children to no. grow, but it may not measure in the same way. And what I love about it, Helen, is, you know, we have that, we have the raised values. We get those five values. Well, the one in the middle's eye, and we really are pushed to, to live up to what that is expecting of us, you know, that inclusion piece. And, you know, friends, friends come and go. Kids learn to be flexible with that, with their friendships, but they, um, they really learn to include a lot of new kids every single year, and I think that's a big, big plus when we're talking about skills <coughs> for their future. And, just and again, not measured here. Not measured here, yeah, yeah, but something I'm proud of. Actually. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so we know that that bottom 25% is different at each one of your schools. Um, it might be made up of different subgroups. It might be made up of, you know, there's all kinds of different things going on. But clearly Atkinson and Kittredge had great success with that lowest 25%. I, I hope, I would encourage you, you know, to look and see if you had been doing some of the same things, if those things were successful, if some of the other schools could incorporate um, some of those things to, to look at. Um, but, it, but they might actually be completely different things because if you're looking at different, um, yeah. different needs in that 25%. Um, but if there, you know, if there are ways to replicate that. And the same thing, you know, looking at, um, you particularly mentioned your fourth grade um, having great growth. You know, is there anything that can be replicated in third and fifth grade or um, at Thompson School or at Franklin School or, um, you know, any of those things? So that's just something I would encourage you to, to look at. Um, I think, too, it's interesting that last year we were all wringing our hands over Sergeant School and, you know, now we're in a totally different place. So, again, it's that snapshot, right? I mean, we don't know if next year at this time or, you know, by Christmas time we're not going to get a picture, right? But, but that doesn't mean we're not growing and, and having an impact and, and change. Um, I, I wanted to really um, thank you, um, Mr. Cushing, for mentioning that we need to be looking at that top 25% and seeing where we can challenge and um, expand their, their learning and their growth. Um, I think that the community will be glad to hear about those things. Um, that might be all I have. Let me just take a quick peek. I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of things. And to, just to preface, and I should have done this when I just mentioned, talked to George, like some of the questions I think that we're asking and saying, it's, they're not just our five thoughts. It's we're anticipating what you're going to hear from other people and trying to get that out in advance. So make sure that you understand it's, that's part of what we're doing. 
Um, relative to what uh, Mr. Tristy said, I, I don't understand or I don't care for this chart of comparing each of you against each other. I think that's kind of useless. I don't know if the state asks us to do that. But I don't see, so the average for North Andover is 43, and then you see how everybody compares, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't see how that's valuable, so I'm glad everybody just has passed by that. Plus, we have to take into consideration that includes the high school, which is a completely different it, it, kind it, of tax. It, that's, it's, it's a silly chart. So um, what are some of my kind of overarching things? So, so one thing is I would like to also say I was really impressed by Atkinson's huge growth in the lower 25%. Um, so, historically, because of the population you're talking about, that's been a place you've had to work on um, and that's understood, but then uh, it's surprising to see why the all is so, so low and, and so that's so interesting. Um, you said when you were talking that you were going to seek um, supports from Central. What kinds of, th do you have any thoughts about what kinds of supports you're thinking about? Are they, and are they different from what you have already been receiving in the past? Or are you still exploring? It, it, we have a limited budget, and we have to look at equity across the schools. So, you know, I think the district's always done a really good job at trying to find ways to help each and every school with what their needs are. I mean, we can't um, we can't leave any school without. So, you know, we have to work with that. But when it comes to reading support, I could use more. We have a lot of kids who don't who um, would. Uh, We've been having to find creative ways to support them with their reading, um, reading skills, but because we have uh, limited personnel, we can't get to every single one. So we've used things like Lexia, which is a great tool. Um, but there are still some students who um, could use extra time and support that can't right now just because of resources. So that's a big thing. We lost a ton of Title I money this right. year. And um, th thankfully, the district was creative with other Title funding to um, still make some things work for me at the Atkinson, but um, that's supposed to be targeted assistance money that helps kids, low-income kids, uh, who need support get support. And so that, that's hopefully we won't you know feel that loss as much as uh, I think we could. But that was a pretty it's a pretty big hit that the district took. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not something that we all experience, but this fluctuation thing that we talked about, like. I don't know what we can do about that, but um, just that it's out on the table and that we all can brainstorm around ways to support kids who do come in or, uh, you know, it could, it, it's not teaching and learning, but it's office support. It's other things that just like making sure that there's enough people around that um, can address some of the specific needs in that building, in my building. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't have all the answers. I mean, right, it's just right. it's stuff that, yeah, it's just stuff to put out there and you know, we're a creative bunch. We can we can come up with things along the way. But you're going to ask as you think of them, and yeah, yeah. Good. Budget season's coming up, so that, that's kind of why I'm getting asking. my pen ready, my list ready. That's what I was told to do. Um, yeah. Um, um, and actually, Helen already hit on this, but I was just curious because of the huge change at Sargent. Like, and it sounds like you identified already through Holly. What did you do to? that your youth can attribute some of that to and then are there things that other people can pick up from that? Um, I'd say like what Holly mentioned, um, Pensacola Lake was a great partnership, um, Karen and the principal over there. So we sent about 10 staff members over there and we looked at a lot of their data and their, they have a data room and how, how can we analyze student work. Um, so we've continued that partnership. Running records is, like I said with Kristen, mm -hmm. um, that's our school-wide goal. So all teachers are using that as their student learning goal and professional practice goal this year. Um, so working in that sense, um, having had that partnership, I think has really been a boost. And then, like I said, the growth mindset. I mean, like I said, Karen's awesome with doing, you know, getting the whole staff on board, and she really did a great job of using that growth mindset to help not only the students but the staff too. Well, that's excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then one other just question. This was kind of overall for all of the schools, um, that the math growth and achievement was much lower in the lower 25, lowest 25 percent for everybody. And I'm just curious, and this was our first year, which you all touched on with Eureka Math, do you think there's any correlation with um, Eureka Math and that lower group needing more time to ramp up, or, or maybe that's a, one of those 
I, I notice I wonder situations. Um, so that was just something I was curious about. I do want to throw out there, it's a different test. So um, what they're asking kids to do isn't something that educators have normally taught and we haven't taught in that way. Simplest example is, you know, you read a passage, let's analyze it, let's figure it out. All right, good job, I think you've mastered this skill. You take MCAS, reading two passages in a poem, compare the characters in each, and write from this bucket's point of view. Kids are like, whoa, we haven't necessarily done that. And teachers were like, wait, when did we sit? We were supposed to do that. Yeah. So now they're having to change. Math did that quite a bit. Kids have never had to read so much solving math problems than now. Which is, Eureka is very strong in that. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. It, it's very language rich, the, the new test. Um, but more importantly, um, there is some research out there that's pretty common with an implementation dip, your first year of full implementation of a program. That was what um, I was yeah. You know, I know we had some pilots in some schools that didn't have it at all, but the schools that we studied in depth, whether it was Groton Dunstable, whether it was North Reading, whether it was Methuen, it was really that second year of full implementation that they saw things really take off. Right. So that's what we're hopeful for. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a few questions. Um, Helen touched on the grade four at Atkinson, and I'm going to spin it slightly differently. Rather than look at grade fours and other have other schools model it, could your other grades model your grade four teachers like, yeah. to see what can Maybe be done? It's been a trend over the last three years or so that that, that team, really two members of the team who had three three different uh, third teachers there, they collaborate and they maximize their time. Lunch times, you know, um, over the years past, we've had opportunities 90 minutes a week during specials to to meet. They, they meet all the time. And I think, um, you know, making that time work and being together, I think, makes a difference. They, they plan sort of in lockstep and teach in lockstep so that everybody continues to stay together. And um, they review their lessons. They talk about what worked, what didn't work. It's definitely a model for all of my other grades mm -hmm. to follow. And um, so we're trying over these trends. Trying, uh, we're going to be working, actually, um, we talked a little bit about it today, but when we meet next Thursday, we're going to be doing a little bit more work on it, pulling out let, what are those key features. Aside from using the time, what are some other things that they're doing specifically to help the kids grow as much as we've seen over the last few years? And, you know, their achievement scores are good, too. So, um, yeah, we'll be working together vertically, three and five. I mean, I, I won't lie, like Amy touched on, the 11 percent is, is a concern. Um, We've seen Sergeant make a huge turnaround in just one year, mm -hmm. so I wonder if there's anything you could take away from them, and similarly from Kittredge. Great. Um, yeah, we'll be talking I, about it. I mean, I know your demographics are, are very different, but not so different from Thompson. So I think um, I think there are ways to improve. So I would encourage you to sure. maybe talk to the others. Like George said, yep. baseline numbers: the lower, the better. Let's go from here. <laughs> yeah. um, and then. Erin, I know how we saw, we all saw how pained Karen was last year sitting around the table yes. having to defend something she inherited. Yes. Um, I just want to, <laughs> I want to say, <laughs> I want to say how proud I am of you guys. I know, I saw firsthand how hard she worked and how hard the teachers worked and it must be so gratifying to see it. It is, like we are so proud of the staff um, and you can feel it when you walk into the building this year. I just think everybody's like really on the same page and um, everybody's continuing to work together because they just want to keep improving. But, yeah. Do you think there's any danger, and I hope the answer is no, of no. becoming too complacent? Or will you still continue to put no. that energy and hard work in? Definitely continue hmm. to put the energy and hard work in. Um, I actually talked to her today, and she has a ton of ideas when she comes back next week. So she's ready to hit the ground running. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, and great job, Rich, on your numbers. Thank Excellent. you very much. David? David said that. I think if I can just add one more thing. What, I, what should be pointed out is that when these kids, no matter where they come from, no matter how their elementary schools perform, when they get to high school, they're doing well on the test. Mm -hmm. We talked about 100% passing. That's amazing. When you lose, use other measurements like, like SATs or ACTs, kids are doing great. Atkinson had the last two valedictorians at the high school. So these kids, are still, whatever they look like now, they're going to continue to grow and evolve, and you know, we all should be proud of that. That's a good point, Greg. Thank you for making this. I'd like to just say this. I'm not afraid of baseline data. This is great. It is a snapshot in time. Um, you know, I think we've gotten away from this being the sole focus of North Andover because this was the sole focus for a long time. What's most important is good teaching and how are we going to get more good teaching. 
and have rigorous hiring processes and make sure that our teachers are getting the PD they need because the magic takes place between the teacher and the kids. Um, and what I'm most excited about, whether it's higher growth, lower growth, higher performance, low performance, um, I truly believe with the Medicaid money, with this team, uh, with the team we've been able to assemble in central office supporting this team, because our job in central office is to support principals. Their job is to support teachers and kids. And um, I think that um, it's really exciting what can happen in North Andover over the next few years with the understanding that this is one snapshot in time. It's two 45-minute tests, and we're going to get an ELA score. But this is how we are measured. And I really like the way the commission is talking about it. Um, I wouldn't be – the accountability and testing is never going to go away. But putting it in the right place is something I, I think that Jeff Riley might be in the process of doing. Um, so I'm pretty excited about it. And um, I think we have the right team in place and the right people on the bus. And now, let's shine a light on it. So these are our numbers this year. Now let's go get them. So. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> so the reason it's most dangerous to compare it to old MCAS, in 16 and 17, only 20% of the schools in the entire state of Massachusetts took MCAS. The rest took the park. So there is no comparison because you only had 20% that took the MCAS yeah. in 16, 17. I'm not interested in looking at the bar that shows how many of our kids yeah. Yeah, yeah. are, you know, advanced or proficient. You know, that, that's yeah. helpful information. And th this doesn't give us that. No, it's hard. It's hard. And, and some of the things that, like, I was just looking at traditionally, these, this was our percentile. Our, this is our percentile growth yeah, I don't, I, from 12 I, to 15. But this is totally different now how it's calculated. Yeah. So it's really right. kind of fascinating. All right, first reading of the overnight trip for the model United Nations. Looks good. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I think it's a tremendously yeah, cool thing. <laughs> Yeah, we've done this year after year, so it's, yep. it's just a, but it's also, I think it's a great, it's a very different type of field trip. Um, it's interesting. So, I like it. All right. Initial discussion regarding FY20 budget directives. We, met, we had our agenda meeting last week and we talked about, really, if you think about our budget directors last year, it was, well, we got to open the ECC, we got to open the Brad Street. Uh, and really, everything after level services went to fund the Brad Street. Um, that being said, um, we know that we, when we came to you a couple weeks ago and had to get some additional positions, we know that we needed more staff even to open the Brad Street and we had some unanticipated costs this year. But I, when we looked at this, um, I think that I mean, one thing I can tell you in my, um, in my entry survey is decreasing class size is still a top concern. It shows up over and over and over again. And that's what we talked about, um, particularly with elementary, is decreasing that class size over this budget cycle and possibly even in the following budget cycle, depending on how much money we have. Um, so our goal is to reduce to uh, class size below 15. I think we're at what, Jim, 17.1? You know, so percent. Still percent. <laughs> so we talked about adding. Where? Yeah, seventeen point one percent. We talked about adding. You know, it, to close that gap to get it to zero, we talked about adding five more teachers, elementary teachers. This thing you're talking about, right? Yeah. Um, so we thought we've added five. We're at we're backfill, three. Okay. Yeah, we're backfilled five, um, and with another five, we think we can get this to close to zero within the budget cycle. Now, that being said, we also have to have discussions during budget season. Would one school maybe benefit from having a little bit larger class size and have an additional reading teacher? Or, um, you know, closing that class size, we really have to look at the populations. You know the struggle is a team we went through last year to place uh, an extra teacher at one particular fifth grade 
that brought the numbers way down because every situation is unique. Right. The one good thing about this team is, you know, a decade ago, it was kind of every man for themselves or every woman for the self. And now um, we've got a better perspective of what's best for the district and overall good. Um, I also think, um, you know, that we have to continue to um, look at the strategic plan. It's already been approved for this year. But, you know, if the increase, say it was, say the increase was 4% just for um, looking at it, 3% of its level services, then you're talking about 1%. So what's 1%, Jim, typically? Well, now it's $450,000. It's $450,000. So, you know, we have to take into consideration a couple things. One, with the strategic plan, as you know, we haven't had all the money over the years to, we've had to bump a few things out, like EL, you know, and that's an area we want to look at. We want to decrease elementary class size. Um, you know, we've, through the entry plan, we know we might need to add, an, you know, an advance on a course at the high school uh, with a teacher. So as we look at these different pieces, how does what we're asking for tie to the strategic plan and what we ask to do? Um, sufficient access to tech, uh, excuse me, ensure we have the needed resources to open the ECC. I still think that that's relevant. I, I still think going into next year, we have to look at, uh, based on uh, the physical layout, some of the different components, um, the, the whole thing. There may be some other staffing that might be needed. Um, I know we came a couple weeks ago for a couple TA positions, the first special education. Um, the, the one, access to technology, I think that's one where we're about two to one in the district um, with Chromebooks. Um, the question I have when Mike Grant comes in to do his technology piece, is this something that may be uh, important, not in terms of access of computers, but um, are there infrastructure needs um, that affect that access? <coughs> But I think that's one that we can probably all agree on when we did our goals, that kind of dropped off the list. Uh, and then last is, um, you know, uh, meeting the needs of, you know, that goal of all students. Um, so in, in many ways, I don't necessarily see this changing. Um, and I think the most important thing is, you know, when we look at the strategic plan and what we said we'd do, how do we get there maximizing the money that we have available? You know, to decrease class size, to meet the needs of all students, to continue to make sure we get staff, make sure the ECC, the Bradstreet has what it needs. Um, all while also looking at, you know, um, other needs as well, like knee ask, et cetera. Have we seen the um, the data? I know in the past we've seen charts with the the class size of each elementary school class, at least in each each. School. Have we seen that? You have it, yeah. We did it in the beginning of October. We had one? Yeah. And you say right now it's at 18%? Is that what you said? We're meeting 18%? We're, we're, we're about 70% over. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, and there are some places, um, you know, we've created a lot more space in some places, but there are some places where it still is difficult to add, you know, uh, another teacher in because they had really inadequate spaces before for art, music, yeah. library. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, it would be really hard to fit another classroom into the Kittredge. Um, it wouldn't be that hard to fit another classroom, two, three, into the Sargent. Another classroom into the Thompson would not be hard. Another classroom into the Atkinson may be a big challenge, um, just based on what's available today. And then, you know... That's even including the fact that we've moved out kindergartners. Right. Like people need to understand yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, one thing is, you know, we said we'd decrease class size. Well, out of the 10 positions we thought we needed, we'd backfill five. Remember we budgeted for the furniture one year, yeah. um, you know, so right. we have those placeholders and we've added them. But at the same time, you can't have, you know, any type of student services for EL, special education. I mean, we've packed them in our schools for the last decades. I mean, hallways and cubbies and nooks in libraries, in storage areas, um, stages. So um, there are some more schools that we'll look at. Now, I will say this, um, that we're looking very hard at where, <laughs> we're working very hard, we're working very hard at, we're, we've already started to identify, so where are the kindergarten kids and where do they belong for next year? You know, how many classes do we run in first grade? So we've already started that analysis um, because that's going to be really critical during budget season. And, and, and what we'll do is, 
you know, if we decide we want to decrease class size, that's for the budget season. And then what we have to do is we have to keep an eye on, um, you know, population and numbers and make a decision in the spring about where we're going to place them and what's the need. And that's something we do every year. So I have, I have a few questions. Um, first of all, like process-wise, we're reviewing last year's budget directives. Are we going to draft budget directives for next year, or what? Where, where are we going? Yeah, these are almost exactly last year, except for the these. One. These, these are, are last year. year. These are last year. So we're reviewing FY last year. FY19 is written on here. That's wasn't FY20 in our online? This is. Oh, that's right. That's this so is FY2019, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's so what we're in. So these are last years. Yeah. And, right. And so the school, what's the process? Right. They're the school committee's directives. So, right. Um, my recollection over time is they, they tend to, we're having a strategic plan for a few years now, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we have the historian of the school committee in the audience, um, but they don't vary that much if we're staying on track with a plan that we right. have and being thoughtful, strategic, and what's sustainable and doable. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't seen them shift dramatically over the last couple of years. I think they've linked the FY20, because the ones I looked at are different than this. So this is what I looked at. This is what I looked at. But I, I think, if I'm understanding your question, like what do we do next? Like do we discuss right now recommendations? Do we funnel them to Dr. Gilligan about what things we'd like to see? Or is the executive our, committee going to talk about right. it and come back to us with a proposal right. that we're going to respond to? The executive committee with a, you know, whatever, the, the chair and the... And the vice chair and the su superintendent. Is that not the executive no. committee? I don't know. I don't, I never, never heard us call that. that. Yeah. Oh, well, I, mean, it sounds, it sounds I like it. Like places <laughs> that I go, we, we call it the executive committee. They set the agenda. They blah blah blah. Right. Um, so we could call it that if we wanted to. Oh, but easy, yeah. um, I mean, we could start, certainly work with uh, Madam Chair, and Madam Vice Chair, of working on some recommendations to bring back. But they are they are the school committee's recommendations. Right. I would just say this. You know, we've made a commitment, it seems, as a committee and as a, a working group together right. to decrease class size in elementary um, and plan, start planning for the middle school to decrease class size. I was there. gonna say what's missing here um, is looking at that. You know, and then I think the other component is all students. So how are we gonna meet the needs of all students? So is that, you know, programming? Is that, you know, you know my entry plan at the high school, for example, uh, you know, we may need a teacher or two to teach a science and a math uh, honors, or you know maybe an extra AP, that kind of thing. So it's it's really looking at. I don't think we're, we're necessarily deviating from any of these. It's but it's making sure that these are in line with the strategic plan, but also reserving the right that I said that I could possibly right. do um, to make one or two recommendations, maybe in December based on my entry plan. Yeah. Like that. Well, so one of the questions that that comes up for me. Um, with the secondary level class sizes to meet programming needs um, and we had a, a parent come in and make a public comment and asking questions about waiting lists and over enrollment and um, I don't feel like we've had good numbers out of the high school in a long time I know we had some average class sizes I don't find those very helpful um, to me I mean and I don't know how granular would make sense to go like I mean do we have a list of all classes and how many students are in them um, but it would be it would be good for us to know um, if you know we know AP classes are capped at whatever it is 24 students, um, but what are CP classes for you know for sciences you know and are we are we meeting the needs of all students if we have you know 32 kids in Spanish class and you know 14 kids in you know French class I'm making up numbers these are not the numbers people <laughs> just making up numbers that that we just don't know and I. I wish I weren't making up numbers. It would be helpful to me to have that data so that we can make sure that our budget directives are yeah. aligned. So two things about that is one, we can certainly do that, but we also got to realize what is the priority. We've set the goals of mm -hmm. elementary, middle, high. It doesn't mean that high school wouldn't get some, but it also doesn't mean necessarily um, when it talks about all students, um, that could be something for high school or it may be you know, looking at the teachers that are existing and changing some of the courses or the, you know, the different pieces. So um, we can certainly get those numbers. I think you know, one of the things, we've never had Steve Nugent in. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'd love him to come in and talk about the college process, Naviance, um, and he could also talk about the numbers. The, the hardest thing about high school is this. There's some real specialized classes 
whether it's AP, special education, uh, mm -hmm. or some really smaller numbers. So when you start dealing with averages, it's really difficult. You know, you have to somewhat look at courses. Then you know, what's World Civilizations One, World Civilizations Two. You know, there's some co-taught classes that are bigger, like American Thought. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so, so maybe it's not numbers that are super helpful to us. Maybe some of that's helpful to us, but maybe, um, you know, we have a new administrator at the high school. Like, where, where are the initiatives? What are we, you know, what are we doing at the high school? What are we seeing for changes? And what, what might he feel are the greatest needs at the high school? Yeah, and I think, you know, as he mentioned the last time, the biggest thing that's happened, this NEASC review is really going to identify what a lot of recommendations, a blueprint for the high school moving forward, which they'll have. Yeah, before, so, before so as the they gather budget, that, before yeah. Before the 21 budget season. Right, so we're not going to have that data to, to really inform this year, is what you're saying. The t fiscal 20 budget. Well, we'll, have, uh, we'll definitely have some entry data on the high school. I spent a lot of time with the high school folks, uh, mm -hmm. staff. Um, entry data, but not the NEASC data. No, NEASC, that self-study is something they're working on now. Right. Um, but we can get the data for the class size, the individual yeah. class sizes. Yeah. And we can I think run. that's helpful because yes. yeah. at the other end of the spectrum, you could have classes with fewer than five students. And, and should we be offering something right. different and using a headcount? Yeah, and, and, and I think one of the things we're going to see is, in, 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 um, you know, one of the things that's going to be important for the committee, because I'm going to bring it to you folks, um, is that the more George and, and, and Chet work together, we may see some curricula changes. Um, that's you may, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, for example, and this is... Anyone who's listening, this is not true. <laughs> but for example, We're making things up here tonight. <laughs> for example, you know, you have to look at supply and demand. You know, so if you took something like, say something like language, what's the supply and demand? And how does that impact what languages we offer 6 through 12? Or supply and demand um, in terms of science electives. You know, do we run this at this? Is there a cutoff number? And there certainly have some cutoff numbers and they have some procedures, but it really, the more that those two work together, the more the NEASC recommendations come out, that's certainly gonna affect the high school. But I also think that our high school and middle school are gonna become more cohesive. As For example, the seventh grade AMS has really boosted our math scores over the last right. couple of years. So I know that's something that I've asked Chet and George to look at with Deb Daly and with um, uh, the math coordinator at the, what oh, slips my mind, at the middle school. Math yeah. I always want to say Wrigley, but he's the vice no, principal now. Uh, Mr. Smith. Oh, Mr. Smith, Bill Smith. Um, because that may impact some offerings mm -hmm. as we go at the high school in the past, if that makes sense. And the technology as well. I mean, we've, mm -hmm. we've done a lot more with technology at the middle school. So I, my only caution is I'd be happy to look at it with them. Is just, it's really a, the, the, the amount of money is, is certainly, um, right. we want to make a case for what we need within that strategic plan. But um, it's definitely not a, um, a wish list. List. Yeah. Right. You know, I think it's class size and then how do we meet the needs of all students? Um, and that, you know, and I think tonight you saw, you know, in that level 25 uh, and also the upper level. Thank you. What we've tried to do over the years is have these be the macro view and the, the budget plan be the micro. And it, they actually align very nicely, the budget plan, the directives, and the strategic plan all align. That's good. Any questions? Any other questions? All right, school building <coughs> committee update, which may be the last one. Real quickly, I'll probably do one more. Hopefully, it'll be the last one. This weather's really been a kick in the pants. I'll tell you, every time we, we schedule something, it gets pushed off, and hopefully, the weather will hold up this weekend because obviously we're doing a lot of this week, the work now just on the weekends. So I'd say uh, the kitchen is just about wrapped. Today we've got our, our, our CO, our certificate of occupancy. The only thing left in there is the roll down door and the countertop and that should be done um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, so that's interior. Outside the site work is done except for the final paving which was supposed to be done last week but we had kind of a hurricane around here. <laughs> Um, and also we're supposed to install the canopy and you need cranes for that so that was not able to take place either last week so the goal is to get the paving done this weekend they'll pave it Saturday and stripe it on Sunday and then the following week we'll get the crane in there and put the canopy in and I think that would wrap it up. Is that about right Jim? 
Yes, except that they now have added the, for, the, for this project, but they've added the um, installation of a new parking lot that actually is part of the recreational fields project, yeah, that, but will be able to be used by um, ECC staff. ECC, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So we've added 22 spots, 10 to the left, 12 to the right, right. and this new parking lot will be 47 additional. Yeah. So pretty exciting. That's <laughs> oh, it's almost over. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Nope. Good Any job. Public comment? Can I, uh, Madam Chair, do you mind if I do show and tell for a second? Sure. <laughs> Who are you? Can you What's do it? Name <laughs> I will. Can you do it in three minutes or less? <laughs> no. <laughs> Ooh. Stanley Bird, 43 Stone Cleave Road. President of the North Native Historical Society. So we're getting there slowly but surely. This is the plaque for the Johnson High School bell out front, right? Oh, wow. nice. And it's all done. And this is a nice, this is a beautiful photo yeah. etching of a photograph about 1880 of the school, of the of Johnson High School and the Stevens Hall at the time. That was where the public, uh, the, the the town hall was here as well as the high school. We're about ready to go. We just have to get some money for that. I was waiting for all the air to clear on construction and everything. So I'll work with Mr. Mealy to figure out a way to get this plaque and the other plaque that Mr. Gilligan, that Dr. Gilligan found at the uh, at uh, the middle school or the yeah it's out here. Yeah. One of the custodians one day said, "Hey, would you be interested in this? I found it behind a bookcase." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have matching plaques, and we just need some money for that. We're good to go. So this will hopefully help visitors to our new facility here know a little bit more about who we are and what our history is. So and, and this site where we're sitting right now is the old yes. Johnson High School plot of land. Actually, yes, this lot. The high school was actually in the parking lot. That was where they found sort of the remains of the high school. So it was sort of to the back side of the lot, right? Um, but anyway, so there and you the go. And the bell is out front here. Mm -hmm. The bell right. is right as you come in the front door, right? So we're going to put these, this and the other plaque next to it. We all Beautiful. could go. And I, if you don't mind, I'll leave this here. You must be willing to get ready to know. Sure. So, there you go. It's so beautiful. It's <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Sam. Oh, and, and I just wanted to put in my plug uh, <laughs> the, the follow up to uh, Mr. Teresi's uh, school building uh, report. We still have the stones out in the parking lot. Oh, I know. Red Street we stones do. are still out in the parking lot. We so, we could do some sort of nice aesthetic. Landscaping, who knows what? Could be a spring project. Could be a spring project, <laughs> that, but I just, you know, I just. Steve, can we get a can we get a clapper for the bell? Yes, yes, I'm okay. still working on it. I'm still working on it. Yeah, nobody will like that for you. But no. Yeah, no. <laughs> so we can actually ring it at three o'clock. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, so we can. But kids are going to pop Electronic. So it actually, there. related to, to that, are, are we going to actually put the name the Ann Brad Street School on the school somehow, like on a little? Just curious. Okay. <laughs> That'll be next school building update. Yeah. Well, we only have a sign for the road, too. Right, right, right. That's, right. That right. That's, right. That's kind of what I, more so. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Budget this year for that. That's what I thought. So. Cool. Any closing comments? Can I just, um, I just want to pick up on what you said earlier, uh, Madam Chair. I want to send my deepest congratulations to Christina Minicucci as well for winning. Um, the 14th Essex State Rep District, uh, which I probably held for many years. Um, I was so excited that she, she won. I know a lot of us worked hard on, on her campaign. Um, obviously a great PTO member, um, fantastic vice chair of the school building committee. So I couldn't be more thrilled that she's representing us. And I want to say congratulations to uh, Diana DiZaglio for winning the state Senate seat and, and Trom Wen for winning the 18th Essex uh, District. I um, want to say uh, thank you to Jim Lyons for his service representing North Dana for the last eight years. Um, and so, you know, moving forward, I think we have a great delegation and looking forward to working with them. Thank you. I couldn't agree more, and I always like to thank everybody who ran and everybody who participated, voting, holding signs, whatever. We had a tremendous number of our school kids um, out campaigning. They weren't ready to vote, but they were uh, doing all kinds of things. Very active season, really exciting. Elementary school kids too, not just yeah. high school kids. That's, yeah, no, that's just said. Oh, they said high school kids. No, 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 no all kids. Lots, lots, lots of kids. Yeah, I, mean, I saw had, a lot of our kids across from Kyle's Rock all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, one other, uh, we talked a lot about the um, 
the North End of Edu Foundation of Education dinner, the Lilith dinner coming up, but also uh, the North End of Music Association. I can't believe you, I'm saying this and not you, Helen. <laughs> the North End of Music Association has their uh, Night to Remember this um, weekend uh, as a big fundraiser for them um, at the North End of Country Club, um, silent auction, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And there are tickets still available. They do a lot to um, support our tremendous music program. Last year I sang at that event. Oh gosh. <laughs> there, was a, there was an auction item you could put in money to be able to sing with the band. I won. <laughs> <laughs> what did you sing? Uh, probably old time rock and roll. Nice. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Oh, you know what? Before we do that, I just oh. want to remind. I know. I was in my motion. I know Dr. Gilligan said at the beginning, but I just want to remind everybody again that our next meeting is on the 29th at 9:30 in the morning at the Senior Center. In case anybody missed it at the beginning of the meeting. So. Do we expect an executive session before that, or? I. We'll find out from Mr. Miller. Do not know. Okay. No. Okay. If we, if we do, I, I probably need to do it before. I couldn't do it after. That'd be in Boston at like 12, 12:30. It would not need to be long, that I can tell you. Okay. Great. Maybe. Will we have coffee and donuts? Just ask them. Uh, I will the season usually yeah. gets the day uh, okay. donuts from heaven. Okay. <laughs> 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 I will move to adjourn, please. Second. Motion by Mr. Trizzi, seconded by Ms. Mabley. Aye. 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 And aye. Thank you all. Thank you.